this is Jay Clark. We're both. I'm sorry, there's a reverberation when you have. How about this? If I talk this loud. There's some of us who are hard of hearing, like okay. myself, and it really helps to have the amplification. Okay, so okay. here, no, not too loud. Okay. 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 So just to tell you a little bit about tonight, um, from now until 7:30, um, the Public Utility Commission. Um, has made the Department of Public Service the host for this session. And we will talk a little bit about the two cases that we're here for tonight. And then Vermont Gas will give a um, short presentation on both of the cases. And then we'll all be available for questions um, up until 7.30 when the public hearing starts. As many of you know, um, when the public hearing begins, there will be a court reporter. And at that, you can really make comments, but the commission can't answer your questions. They're just here to listen to what you have to say. So um, this part, we hope that you'll have lots of questions and that we can give you some answers. <laughs> so very briefly, um, there are two cases that um, we're here about tonight. It's a joint hearing. The first one involves depth of cover with the gas pipeline, which is, you know, 41 miles, it's in the ground and it's operational. And so on the one case we're dealing with tonight is um, the Certificate of Public Good condition um, had a burial depth of, I think, four feet for the entirety of the pipeline. There are 18 locations within the clay plain swamp that are less than four feet. And so largely, that investigation is dealing with those 18 places where the pipe is less than four feet. There are also, the commission asked for my guest to do a root cause analysis of um, a voltage um, situation that arose earlier with the pipeline and with the harsh sunflower cutting, and they had submitted that in this docket. And then as well, um, Vermont Gas was asked, and they have also done an affidavit about the depth of pipeline for the entirety of the area. So, and BGS will go into that a little bit more as we go through the night. And then I'm going to let Jake tell you about the other um, docket, which is very new. All right, can you hear me okay? All right. This docket is number 17-4630, and it's officially captioned the investigation regarding the alleged failure of Vermont Gas Systems to comply with the final order and certificate of public good in docket 7970 by failing to observe the requirements of the blasting plan. Um, on October 24th, 2017, the Public Utility Commission opened an investigation into whether BGS violated that order and the certificate of public good by failing to observe the requirements of that blasting plan. The blasting investigation is based on five allegations that arise from a blasting incident that occurred during blasting in Moncton, Vermont on June 20th of 2016. Uh, the presentation by Vermont Gas Systems will address those allegations. And then, and then before we turn it over to BGS, lastly, and I think most of you know this, the Department of Public Service is a party to both of these proceedings as we are to all proceedings before the Public Utility Commission. VGS is obviously a party. And then there are several parties that have intervened um, in both of these dockets. And I think some of you are here tonight, I see some of you. And so um, at this point, we'll let VGS do their presentation about the two dockets. Is this volume good? Okay, if at any point during this the microphone slips and you can't hear me, please signal and I'll try to speak up or reposition the microphone. So first, thank you for coming out this evening. I appreciate it and we look forward to taking your questions. I'm Eileen Similardis. I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Vermont Gas. And with me we have Deb Buffard, who is legal counsel. Jeff Nelson from VHB, he's an environmental consultant for us. John St. Hilaire, Vice President of Operations, he served as the senior manager on this project 
for the last couple of years, and also two other Vermont Gas employees are with us, Karen Kotecki and Chris LaForce. So hopefully between us, we'll be able to answer your questions. So um, at the risk of repeating what the department said, let me just give you a little bit of an overview. Um, we're here tonight for two separate Public Utility Commission proceedings. The first is case number 173550, and as the department said before, that's regarding um, the alleged failure of Vermont Gas to comply with our Certificate of Public Good in Docket 7970 regarding burying the pipe at 18 different locations in New Haven. The second proceeding is case number 17463 INV, and that's regarding the alleged failure of the company to comply with its final order, our certificate of public good in 7970, by failing to observe the requirements of the blasting plan. So what I'm going to do tonight on each of these is I'll take them individually. I'm gonna give a little bit of background on the cases and why there's um, an alleged um, allegation of violating our CPG, then I'll give you the history of where we are and then sort of next steps in the process. But let me just start with a little bit more background on that. First, and it's so easy to fall into lingo, so again, if I use any terms or acronyms that people aren't familiar with, please raise your hand and stop me and I'll try to clarify. Let me start with docket 7. The CPG Certificate of Public Good? That's exactly what I was gonna say, yes. CPG stands for Certificate of Public Good. So in docket 7970, which some of you uh, have heard us refer to as ANGP or the Addison Project or simply the project, that was um, a docket that we initiated in December of 2012 actually. And it was designed to bring natural gas service to Addison County communities. And it entailed the construction of 41 miles of transmission pipe, three gate stations, and approximately five miles of distribution mainline. We received our Certificate of Public Good, our initial CPG on that, on December 23rd, 2013. And the project has been in full operation since April of 2017. This is a map of the full service territory, but the ANGP portion is about from here down to Middlebury. So turning first to docket 17, or actually they don't refer to them as dockets anymore, as, yes. It was not part of this project, it was a separate docket. Okay. And he's, uh, he's referring to our 16-inch transmission line. We had a separate proceeding where we looped or put in a parallel pipe, and we constructed that three years ago now-ish? Um, last summer? Oh, looping? Yeah. I'm off a of phase. So, but that was not part of this proceeding. So the first case, is, is 173550, which we also refer to as the depth of cover proceeding. So in this case, what the PUC will ultimately decide is whether or not we have violated our final order and the CPG by burying the pipe at less than four feet in 18 locations in the Velco right away in New Haven. Velco is also an acronym for the Vermont Electric Transmission Company, and it's the, it's the electric transmission system here in Vermont. So questions to be addressed by this investigation include whether or not our deviation from ANGP plans is a material or substantial change, and if it is a material or substantial change, is it appropriate to order any remedial action, impose a penalty, or take other steps authorized by law? And this is a quoting from the commission's order. As the, the department um, representative said a moment ago, the investigation also required Vermont Gas to certify that the rest of the project outside of those 18 locations was buried at the depth required by that 2013 final order in docket 7970 and to conduct a root cause analysis about why that deviation in the depth of cover occurred as well as root cause analyses on two other matters, one related to the harsh sunflower and another related to induced voltage. So I just wanted to stop for a second on the process and the players. So. 
The way this works is Vermont Gas is the petitioner in this case, and we made a request with the commission. We made a request for a non-substantial change. We filed that request with the commission and all the parties to docket 7970. When we made that filing, we included some supporting information. Where we are now is we're responding to information from other parties. So that's Vermont Gas's role. Then there are other parties to the case. The department is already a party. Actually, anybody that was a party to docket 7970 is automatically a party to this proceeding. The role of those people or those parties is they look at Vermont Gas's filings, they ask detailed questions of Vermont Gas, they get input from the public, which is part of what tonight's proceeding is about, then they form independent positions and make independent filings with the commission. And then the commission serves as the judge in a proceeding. They will review all the evidence, they will hold hearings, they too get input from the public, the second half of tonight's, and then they will issue a final order. So that's sort of the roles of the parties in this proceeding. So a little bit of background. Docket 7970, the ANGP docket. We entered, we, Vermont Gas, entered into a memorandum of understanding with Delco. And we'll hear those called MOAs or MOUs. The term gets used interchangeably. So we entered into an MOA with Velco regarding how we were going to co-locate our pipe in the Velco corridor. The MOA states that within that Velco corridor, we will design the project in Velco's right of way to meet a certain loading standard. It's paragraph five of that Velco MOA. So that's sort of critical fact number one. We have an MOA with Velco that has a loading requirement in it. Further, the certificate of public good that was issued. So, um, what does loading? It's the, the, the weight that the um, pipe could bear something on top of it. So picture a truck driving over the top of the right. What's the, 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 the loading or the weight that the top of the pipe could bear? Yeah, I got, what was the induced voltage that you mentioned earlier? Um, I, I'd like to have John speak to that. Do you want to answer that now, or do you want to hold it and we'll get through this first? Or? Okay. Um, so the second critical point is that the CPG that was issued December 23rd requires Vermont Gas to compl comply with all of the MOUs that we entered into. So we entered into these agreements, and then the commission says, Vermont Gas, you have to honor those MOUs. The CPG also has a condition in it that says you have to build this project consistent with the plans and evidence that you put forth in this project. And if you're going to deviate from it in a, in a material way or a substantial change, you need to get pre-approval from the commission to do so. So those are the relevant provisions. So during September 2016, when we were constructing the pipeline in an area of New Haven that we refer to as the Clay Plain Swamp, that is within the Velco right of way. So it, this is all occurring uh, the middle of September. At 18 locations along about a half mile stretch of that pipeline, we are buried with at least three feet of cover, which is what the federal code requires. You'll hear the federal code referred to as FIMSA or the federal code but at less than the four feet of cover contemplated by the Velco MOA. We confirm... Contemplated? That was actually what was agreed upon, right? It was not contemplated. Well, I think that's part of what the commission will decide in this case, but what the, what the Velco MOA actually says is it's the loading standard that we need to meet, which we intend to meet by uh, in burying the pipe at four feet. So why wasn't it done at four feet? If you can hold that, I will get you it. But that is, that is fundamentally the question that the commission will be deciding here. The, the, the quick answer is um, at less than four feet, we have met the Velcro loading standard and we had their concurrence to do so. But whether or not that's a material deviation or a substantial change to the project is exactly the issue that the commission has to decide in this case. Yes? You mentioned September. Um, was, what year was that? 2016. And that was, that was when this happened? That's when the construction occurred, yes. So when you say less than, there's 
many numbers less than four. So it's between three and four. It's between three and four. Five and three, or excuse me. Is it between two point five and three? No, it's greater than three and less than four in all eighteen locations. And that withstood the loading. Exactly, the loading standard. Exactly. How are you defining those eighteen locations? Is that eighteen? No, there are 18 discrete locations oh. across a half mile, and we actually gave the, um, as part of the certification of the pipeline, we went uh, well, um, a, a piece of pipe is roughly? Could be 20 to 50 feet long. So 20 to 50 feet piece of pipe, and we measured it every weld. So every every 20 to 50 feet, the depth was measured. So it's a continuum. Point A to point B, 18 measures in between. So it's basically that whole length. It doesn't go. It's across a half mile section. 18 so locations. A half mile of pipe that's not buried properly. 18 locations within a half mile. That no, you 18 a half mile of pipe that's not buried. If it, it wasn't spots, going like this. If it's 18 you know, spots, it's a continuum. Unless that pipe goes like this. Right. <laughs> We're assuming the pipe is parallel to the... I understand your point, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I can answer it that way. Okay, I can answer that way. But John can. Okay. Sorry, does this work? Can everyone hear me? Um, same thing, if I talk about acronyms, you tend to, in the construction side, you tend to use them a lot, so if I use them, please uh, correct me. Um, so what we did is, is we're building the pipeline. We do have these, what we call sticks, or, or sections of pipe. And every time we weld them together, we had a depth reading on each weld. So uh, it said some pipe can be 20 feet long, some can be 50. So in this uh, 2,500 foot section, we had a number of locations where we measured the depth. We do not have, uh, and it's not an industry standard to measure a continual depth across every inch of pipe. You typically do it on certain intervals, and as a best practice, you do it every weld. And that's what we did. So what did you just say? There's 22,000 feet of pipe at a time. Very There's 2,500 feet, and we have 18 locations we're measuring between three, and, between three and four feet, and the other measurements are above four feet. So the pipe is not a pair. And can I take a stab at rephrasing? The question is whether it's reasonable to think for all 2,500 feet that it's less than four feet. That is it. Has to be. Yeah, and, and so these are all continuous. So when you look at the, the well, you can have one well that's not the next one that is well, over four feet. So it depends on the contour of the uh, surface and also where the pipe lies. So you can actually have one that's um, you know just over four, and one that's just under four, and one that's just over four, or they could be a couple that are in a row. But it seems perfectly obvious that the question I have is why are they not four feet, which was the agreed upon thing. I, I don't understand what what prevented you from going down four feet to, to be legal. So yeah, in this area, um, the process of installing the pipe has a kind of sequence of, sequence of events. Um, and I know in the uh, 7970, there was some information about uh, clearing the right of way to stringing pipe to welding. Um, so when they actually get to the point where they're installing the pipeline, they install the pipe, and then they have to um, kind of do a final cleanup um, and put all topsoil and everything back on top of the the, the trench. Um, and so they'll take a reading of the depth when the pipe is installed, and then they have to take another reading after they've already cleaned up the site. So there could be a time uh, difference um, from the time the pipe's installed to when the, the actual final measurement is uh, achieved. Uh, and during that time, you can have settlement. Um, you can have, in this area, it was so wet, and uh, what I'm hearing from the team is that it's just wet, soupy material that it just moved around. So when they were installing it, the actual depth that they were measuring, when they finally determined the depth, which was actually in this area, it was two months later, it was November 4th, I think, um, that the, the actual, what they were measuring changed during that time just because of the consistency of the soil. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 
you mean the actual change? Well, that's what we think, because the death was less, that it actually settled. So that's why it's, it, we, it settles, we, we, yeah, we believe that it, it kind of, the ground settled, it kind of moved around. So we don't, the ground didn't get deeper, it just kind of, it, it settled out. So when they're moving um, out of the location, we had um, wood mats. So we had, uh, because of the wet soil, we had to actually build a platform in this area to bring the excavators on. So when they were pulling those mats out, you can actually have ground movement um, after the install. So you can just have the, the kind of the wet soil kind of resettle. And that's where the, the, we believe the depth changed. What you're saying initially is that you got it down before people in the ship. That's correct. Actually, we didn't have, at the time of construction, we didn't confirm the depth uh, that it was less than four feet until November. So I don't know that Vermont Gas is walking out saying in September it was at four feet. I can't, yes. I can't say that the, the, the final measurement wasn't taken to determine the, the actual depth until November, however, the contract at the time. Um, when they're doing this, and even outside of the, the swamp, when they did it, uh, the whole 41 miles, they uh, trench, they install the pipe in what they believe is their uh, appropriate depth, and then we check afterwards. So at that time, what I'm hearing is that they felt that they were at the four feet, and then they cleaned up and then they took the measurement to verify. So you're blaming the contract? So, I don't, Jim, I don't know if you want to um, moderate. A quick question, if I could, because um, all these questions are great. Do you want to have VGS run through the presentation for the boat and then come back to the Questions. I'm a little concerned we're not going to get to the next case, and there are two cases that are the subject of tonight. We have no, we're not getting the answers. About the death in the load, the load. Um, I, I think we should settle this before moving on, and maybe just limit if things to uh, limit the questions to the uh, the issue about where the pipe is depth-wise, and how um, the, the loading distribution is, um, is, is, uh, um, is known to stay uh, legal throughout the lifetime of the pipe. It, if, if, it can, if it can sink, if it can move up and down in the, in the media now, it certainly will continue to to do that, and how do you how do you stay legal with the loading? That's a really good question. So, when let, let me just let me just jump to this for a second. So, what we ended up doing with Velco is the agreement with Velco culminated in them giving us a written document saying that the pipe at less than four feet met the loading requirements, but it also has some requirements for ongoing management and ongoing evaluation. So that is part of the agreement with Velco. Thank you. I need to ask, why are we having this
they went to Velco, with whom they had the MOU, and Velco did whatever they do, and they said, well, you did not meet the four feet, but it did meet the loading standard. Does that help at all? I think the four feet was put in there as a, if everything was at four feet, they wouldn't have had to go back to Velco. Exactly. Because exactly I asked that same question about five times when I first got involved. Well, aren't, aren't Velco and BGS sister companies with uh, Gas Metro, so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an agreement within the family. No. <laughs> Yeah. Not, you know, uh, let me just explain. So, Vermont Gas is owned by Gas Metro. Gas Metro also owns Green Mountain Power. Velco is, in fact, owned by the electric distribution systems in the state, but, but as part of the um, Gas Metro acquisition of uh, Green Mountain Power, they address some of the, the Velco issues there. So, Velco is not an affiliate of Vermont Gas. Mr. Sandler, to say that he didn't know until November that it wasn't at four feet? That's when we got the final confirmation in November after the surveys were done. May I then ask you why you solicited and received a letter from Velco on September 21st saying, based upon information and discussions yesterday afternoon, Velco agreed for you to move forward with the installation of the gas pipeline at less than the agreed four foot depth. That was September 21st. That was not November. That's correct. So what we had, uh, when the, the construction team was out there installing the pipe, um, it is, uh, and everyone I've talked to who was, was out there, um, it was extremely tough construction because of the wet uh, soupy material. Um, at that time, uh, we had reached out to Velco and said, um, and this is a really tough area, and if they have uh, any issues getting to the four feet, what does that mean? So in this project, we were making decisions, you know, hundreds of them a day on many different things, and anytime we saw something come up, we would look into it and address it. So the team was, was out there working this very tough area. So we reached out to Velco and said, um, we don't know where, the, where they're gonna end up, but let's have a conversation just to be prepared and talk about it. Explain how you determine the depth of the pipe. Um, so, uh, in a general sense, um, I'll use some uh, some terminology like it, like I'll use. Uh, well, let me just go through it. Uh, we use a GPS uh, device, uh, and I'm just going to use this pen for example. Um, and a team, a third-party engineer, was hired for this job, and as the construction team installed the pipe, they would take a measurement at every single weld. So they would go out into the, to the trench, and they would take this, it's, it's actually about five feet in, uh, tall, and they would actually put it on the weld and take a measurement. And this would give you an X, a Y, and a Z. Uh, and then you have the, the backfill, the cover, where they put the final topsoil on, regrade it to the final. Um, and then the engineering team would go back out, and they have the X and the Y. Um, they go back to that location, and if they take another sh um, shot, they can actually get the X, Y, Z. The X, Y zeroes out. You can take the different. Sorry. What do you mean they take another shot? They shot they, how do they put the stick on the Y? They, they, so they don't put it on the well. They. Um, it, it's it's the ground surface over it. So if I actually were to like take this pen and put it on the floor, I could take an X, Y, and a Z, and then if I pull the table over, I could find the X and the Y to go directly over the weld. And if I take that reading, the GPS reading, what the Z axis is the the elevation. And if I take the difference between the surface that I measure and the one I measured on the weld, I can get the depth. Is that? I don't think you've asked a question. Yeah, I had a question about the loading standards. Everything that I've seen in your filings about loading standards has been for generic soil. Wouldn't that be different for this? I think your words were wet and soupy soil. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that change the loading standards? It would, it could, but we had a report done on different types of soil. Yeah, and that's, uh, it, it's a great question. Uh, and it does change. And one of the things that uh, we weren't sure of is how much it would change. So we, we actually reached out to 
a different engineering firm that does this. And we said, can you run a bunch of um, scenarios with different depth, different types of soil from uh, you know, hard gravel to soft sills with uh, a lot of um, water in it and, and calculate what this, uh, the weight or the loading capability of the pipe was. Um, and from that analysis is how we determined that uh, the loading standard could be met on basically uh, any soil type. Okay. Uh, sorry, at the depth that they calculated at. Okay, so suppose we have a, uh, a piece of pipe and um, it's at a, a, a certain X, Y, and Z. Okay? Now, you, you, you measure down to where that, um, that uh, piece where it is tangent to the normal right there, okay? And you got soupy uh, meat, uh, material around it, and it can migrate. <laughs> so, so when you come back to test it, what happens if your coordinates say you, it should be right here, but the height is actually there, and you go down further? Or it might have come up like that. So if I understand the question, the question correctly, um, you're asking if when the, between the time of the first measurement, which is in the well that's installed, and the time of the second measurement, can the pipe move and change the dimensions? Well, yeah, you already said, well, not you, but uh, you said that um, because of soupy, um, Material, it, it does move. It, it can, and uh, even outside of um, the swamp, in just the installation, um, you use uh, pipe supports, so actually the pipe can settle down a little bit, so you can see a little bit of movement. Um, typically, it's not a lot, but you can see a little bit um, in this area and, and in most wetlands, or actually all wetlands. Um, we use concrete coated pipe, and that's the concrete coated pipe is a weight, so it's it's to hold the pipe down, um, and that's standard in the industry, so it, so it prevents it from coming up. Giving buoyancy, it, it would go down. I mean, it, it, would go, it wouldn't go down, but if it was, um, if, it, if, it, if it was heavier than that, um, it, it, might, it, it, it depends on the density of the material that it's embedded in. Not, not just the, uh, the, the concrete around the pipe, but the, uh, the, the amount of liquid in the, uh, in the soil. Right, yeah, so I think what I, if I understand correctly, you're asking about the, the buoyancy effect, which, so if the pipe, if it's, um, if it overcomes the buoyancy, could the pipe settle? Um, it, it could go down some, and if it's, uh, it can overcome it, can it become buoyant? Um, it can, that's, that's typical, but that's why the, uh, and through the design, they use that concrete coated coat pipe um, to be able to provide the weight. Um, sometimes in other areas, you might see what they call pipe sacks, um, they actually just wrap over a pipe with uh, sandbags to hold it down. Um, so that's that's designed to maintain in, in, in that area. So there can be some uh, small amount of movement to we don't see a lot, but, but the concept um, is true. Okay, so, so if the, the, the change to loading width could happen? Um, what we have looked at is the, the loading down to that three, four, and five feet. Um, so if the if there's a material change uh, on the pipeline, um, yes, if a lot of cover material would not cover would change. Um, and that's why with talking with Oco, we've set up a, several different uh, uh, um, uh, safety items, like we're gonna meet every single year and talk about our, our maintenance and activity. Um, our call centers have their numbers, so if they're gonna have to do any uh, work out there, we know about it, we can uh, work with them to make sure that we protect the pipe. We, uh, we have we have to patrol that pipe four times a year on a quarterly basis. So we're going out there, we're looking at the the area, and if we see any kind of uh, change in the contour, we can address those things. So, so everything would be um, um, recorded in open to the public to see. Yeah. Commissioner, you have a question. The results of your tests would be available to the public. So I don't for accountability. It's a certificate of public good. That's for the public. So we should have access to that information. So we can talk about um, the investment <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that is up to, I mean, a lot of our information, we work with the department, the department, uh, we share information with, we'll have to talk about what kind of form or, or uh, 
uh, at that site. So, so I'm sorry, you okay. and then Mary. I was wondering about the soupy material. You mentioned a different engineering firm certified for you, if that's the right word, that this material was okay to put the pipe through. Is that, am I, got, am I correct so far? We have an engineering firm who designed the original pipeline uh, for the whole 41 miles. Uh, through these swamps, through um, you know, some use of HDD, um, river crossings, uh, open and they, trash. And, and once they saw, because you can't really tell when you start seeing the blasting, what this was like, the engineering firm was, was okay for them. They were part of the project, um, the whole thing. So they were, um, the, the engineering firm was actually the same firm that was doing the death readings. Um, so they were aware of uh, the construction out in the field, um, the conditions that we were encountering, and they designed the pipe with um, to uh, account for many different soil conditions. So, so um, I, what, what I'm getting at is, is what is the name of the, this different engineering firm? Uh, Sierra Engineering. Sierra Engineering. So there's a couple of things we should point out here. Um, regarding this is while there's clearly an investigation into whether or not we have um, violated our CPG as it pertains to depth of cover, Vermont Gas's engineers and the, the firm that did the second analysis is Mott McDonald, um, reviewed it and confirmed it would be acceptable. Velco's engineers reviewed it and determined it was acceptable. And while the Department of Public Service clearly supported an investigation into whether or not we have violated our CPG. Their independent engineer also has determined that there's no safety issues relative to the pipe that the depth is buried at. So anybody who's been in Vermont in the winter knows what frost heaves and sinkholes are in the roads. And those roads are pretty substantial, and yet they can heave right up or open right up with a big old pot of coal. This pipe at being less than four feet, or even at four feet, is not below our frost line here. I don't know that it's going to withstand those types of heavings and, and sinkings, and it's not, um, the cement coating doesn't comfort me <laughs> to know that that's going to hold it down. So if we go back to the first map that we put up, we have um, had a transmission infrastructure in Vermont since 1965. Um, the bulk of that is not buried to below the, I don't know if any of it's well below the frost line. So the, the pipeline is designed to deal with frost and we do frost patrols regularly on that. What does a frost patrol consist of? So the frost patrol is, sorry, is uh, just going out in the winter time and just uh, patrolling the pipe. So we're looking for gas leaks or any, any kind of change. So um, we walk the pipeline roof in the winter and check. We do. We, have, we actually are required to do that four times a year. So we're out uh, on a quarterly basis um, and we walk the pipeline. So there, you will see um, from our gas technicians they have uh, gas uh, detectors and they are walking and taking. Um, uh, information uh, about the pipeline. So there, it could be um, uh, a landowner or someone on the pipe. I've seen where uh, people have driven out and left a vehicle. We have to go research that just to find out who's out there. Um, we've had landowners who have, um, uh, you know, cut trees or started to build buildings in the right way. So we just want to follow up with them. Um, so it's our opportunity to get out there and share the safety of the pipeline. So this lady can say I'm like that. I'm going to go back just for a minute to my original question uh, in, in kind of a sort of roundabout way. The agreement to have the pipeline going in at four feet, is that stated in the original certificate of public good? Is that le legally in there? Forget about Velcro. I want to know what's in the certificate of public good. 
Should I answer that one first? Sure. <laughs> okay, so um, I believe it is. Now, Debbie Ford is a lawyer for UTS. She may or may not agree with that. And Jim Dumont is a lawyer in the case, and he may or may not agree with me. And so, as, as Eileen said earlier, um, a lot of this will have to be decided by the Public Utility Commission because we all may um, have, have different opinions on that. I just wonder what is the certificate of a public good in writing? So, the, the relevant finding, I'm doing this from memory, I believe is on um, the infamous finding 62 in the CPG, which references four feet in Velcro. And that is one, that is exactly one of the things the commission will have to decide. But recall that this whole proceeding started because Vermont Gas made a filing asking the commission to uh, determine that not being at four feet in these 18 locations is not a non-substantial change or a material deviation from our, from our certificate of public good. So we have, we have asked them to say that this is not a significant change from that CPG. That's exactly what we've asked them to do. That, that's the language, but literally the three lawyers can sit down and have a difference of opinion. I wonder what we No. You should see that. That would be the place to look. I'm almost positive it's finding 62 in the, in the, um, in the board, final board order. And I think Jane was next. And then really quickly, at some point, so as not to get in trouble with the PUC, we're going to have to do two, two minutes on the blast thing. If you have no questions, that's fine. We just got to talk about it very quickly, then we'll come back to this just to cover the base. But Jane? I have kind of an obvious question. Why would you go through this swamp? There were many other swamps and, and marshlands that you avoided by doing horizontal directional drilling. And this, I think you were warned about this swamp by the people that live near there. Why would you try to put a pipeline through there? Um, and and I, I mean, I, I don't really want an answer to that question, but that's a question that's here. And then the other thing is, why was it a year later that you're asking for a non-substantial change when you knew in September of 2016 it was not deep enough, it only came to light when a, when a citizen showed a photograph um, to the, DP, uh, the department? I, I guess I want to know why do we have to do your job? So are you talking about the photograph that was Pass around when we were I'm all at Montpelier High School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I believe that was a photograph taken um, when the pipe was staged. So, if I rem am I remembering correctly? Yeah. So it was the beginning of all of this. Nothing was said about a non-substantial change until that photograph surfaced, and now suddenly we're focusing on that particular part of the pipeline. So, so, so to be clear, I don't remember that connection. I know that VGS <laughs> said um, we have 18 locations where we're at less than four feet. And they made a filing with the commission. But it was a year later. You, ad you admit that it was a year later. I, a year later from? That was February 2016 or 17. 17. The, the only thing I know about that pipe is what our engineer said that night. and it I think a, a picture of a pipe that was being staged. So I'm, that picture of that pipe, to the best of my knowledge, had nothing to do with this depth of cover. It's the same place. It wasn't staged. And that picture was taken on September 19, 2016, in the evening, and uh, BGS moved their people out of there on the 20th. So if it was staged, they sure did a lot of work in hurry. So if I could respond to the, the timing of the notice. You're correct, construction occurred over the 19th and the 20th. We did not have final confirmation as to the depth of cover in, in not just in that area, but in other areas of our pipeline until November. I think I had that on an earlier slide. 2016. Excuse me? November of 16, so September of 16 to November of 16, two, two months difference. And then from December through April, we were working with Velco to get final confirmation as to what the protocols they would want us to follow to make sure that the pipe would continue to meet their loading standards and that something less than four feet but more than three would be acceptable in those locations. That culminated with a written document from Velco in late April and then we made this notification June 2nd. 
So we were working with Velco over that timeline. Um, I recall the DPS saying that they had somebody on staff checking the depth of that pipe. 24-7, seven days a week. So, well, I don't know, here's what I know. We have an internal gas engineer. Um, during the construction, we hired a contract, an external engineer who is in the field. And then we have another external engineer who does reviews of the information they come up with. Well, whatever you have, there's still somebody who's supposed to be checking the depth daily. It shouldn't have to take two months or one week or one day. I mean, you, you have a guy there inspecting the depth, supposedly, at the every day. At the high school, you said that that's the way that the DPS covered it. Every day, there was somebody else there. I think generally that's correct. I, I don't know how, I'm a lawyer, not an engineer. I don't know how they measure the depth when they're um, installing a pipe in the swamp. And, and I think we need to remember that while, we're very, while this proceeding was about those 18 locations in the Clay Plain Swamp, this is a 41 mile pipeline, and we measured the well, we measured the depth of cover at every well, so essentially anywhere every 20 to, to 40 feet. So depth of cover is, um, it sounds like it should have been easy to do on just 18 locations, but we did it for 41 miles, and the report that we got really was for all of those, and that's part of the of the timeline. Um, I don't, Jim, it's up to you, but we still have to do the last thing. Yeah, up until you, Senator Bray, and then you, and then we got to do two minutes on blasting, and we can come back to this. I guess uh, my question is, how do we know that the ground settled? Um, is that a rationale that was made in hindsight in November? Or, or perhaps, are there other reasons, perhaps inaccurate depth readings, or maybe it was placed shallow in the first place? How do we know that the ground, the ground settled, I guess? So this is one of the um, uh, assumptions that we're looking at because there was so much activity in there um, that it could be, I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of theories out there. You can't have points, you can have, um, uh, again, I can go up or down. Um, it, is, it was just so wet and mucky in there. And when they, I mentioned this earlier, they used these wood mats to get in. And when they were stacking them one on top of the other, trying to get a stable base for the equipment to go in, um, that they said when they were pulling those out, you can have displacement going on and just the surface moving around. So that was what we were, um, uh, that was the, the item that the contractor felt is why that happened. Um, but you were, I mean, I can't point and say that's exactly what that is. Um, but based on the conditions, that's what they felt was going on. So that just to clarify, that rationale came from the contractor on the ground? That the ground settled and that's the reason why it's, it it's one of the ones that did, there's many, again, there's many different factors and they felt because of how they had to work in there that they felt that that was the, the cause. Senator Bray. Um, quick question, I'm just trying to, you had an earlier slide, so in terms of trying to understand whether the project met the conditions of the CPG, there was a reference to uh, HS20, which VGS intends to meet by varying, there we go, yep. the bullet there. So is HS20 uh, the loading, is that the language? That's the, the, that's the Velco loading standard. And is that literally the way it's phrased, which you intend to meet by? That's, that is verbatim. Okay. So is it that you must meet the loading standard, and how you meet it, the depth is irrelevant, really. You so, can do it one way, but if you could do it in two feet and meet the loading standard, that would be sufficient? Yeah. Well, no, because the, the, the federal code requires three feet. Okay. So th there's, a, there's a, at least a three foot. Um, but your, your, um, your phrasing of that is the requirement there, the loading standard or the four feet is candidly one of the, one of the issues that the commission will have to decide. Vermont Gas has a perspective on it, but that is, that is the nub of the question. Which is the prevailing um, requirement, the loading standard or the four feet? Thank you. And then so I wanted to understand this. As I understand it, you requested this non-substantial change after you made the change. 
if I recall, for all of the other non-substantial changes, the designations you requested, you always did them in advance. Is that correct? You are absolutely correct. Okay. This is non-substantial change six. It's the only one that we made after the fact, um, partially because um, knowing about depth of cover is not something you could know beforehand, and everything else was really around, around rooting. But didn't you actually have discussions about the fact that it was going to be hard to build it at this depth with your engineers already a year before, a few months before you actually did the installation in September? No. Okay. Um, and not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I, I, and I understand that you measured the depth on November 4th, did you say? It was November. I don't have the exact date. Do you, John? Yeah, I have to check. I think it's November 4th, but I'm subject to the check. Okay. And the pipeline was pickled at the end of uh, October, that segment, the segment from the south of, from the uh, MLV in Charlotte, on Charlotte Road, to uh, Middlebury was pickled at the end of October? No. Mm -hmm. was it pickled? So, just uh, the, the question is about pickling the pipe. That may be the term that people aren't uh, familiar with. Natural gas is odorless in its natural state, so we add an odorant to it. And uh, early on, the, the pipe can actually absorb that odorant, so it's called pickling, where you continue to put odorant in until the, um, the gas will be properly odorized when it comes out the, uh, out the other end. I don't know why they call it pickling, but they do. But that's what you're referring to. But no, that you don't pickle a pipe until you start to have gas in it. OK, so when was gas? My understanding was that your plan, according to your gasification plans, um, that you were going to put gas into segment two and segment three and let that just sit there and store uh, before you actually had gas starting to flow to customers. So what I'm asking is when did gas first, any gas of any kind, first get put into the pipeline, into that segment? Into the segment that we're referring to yeah. here? Yes. Uh, had to been posted to Prax, so. Yeah, it was April, 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 April. And was that true of segment two as well? When you're referring to segment two, the, those are not really discrete, defined. So the only one that's a defined segment is that first one. Section one of segment two, as defined in your gasification plan for the gasification that occurred on October 6th or 7th of 2016. The one that you have the inadvertent release on. <laughs> uh, oh, that one. I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. So um, I think what you're talking about, we had four different uh, gas subs on the project. Um, and the first one was down to uh, north of uh, Chabrags. Um, and in that, uh, we turned uh, and, and injected gas into that section. And we put water into that. And we uh, checked the owner levels in that the, the gas wasn't flowing. Um, it was just basically like a storage vessel. Um, but it was, we did put water in uh, day one as we turned the gas on. Okay. But so, and so what I'm asking is, when was the portion from the gate station located on the Charlotte Hinesburg Road to Middlebury, your next gate station, when did you do that same operation? That's what I'm asking. That would be the portion of the Tribes HED, and that was done in early April of 2017. So for the rest of that period the, between when you finished constructing and then that segment of the pipe was empty, it had nothing in it. It actually had nitrogen and compressed nitrogen. So you had you had injected something into it. We had it injected an inner gas just it's under low pressure. Um, it was just for the integrity of the pipeline. Uh, typically when you put a you complete a pipeline, uh, you want to put something in it. Um, nitrogen is a nice dry gas, you put uh, a small amount of pressure in it to keep the moisture out of it. So it was kind of like story until we could finish the drag drill. Okay. Now, is that considered an operations task or a construction task under the federal rules? I'd have to look into that. Would that be in your operations and maintenance manual or program, or would that be in your construction? Was that in your construction specifications? Are you referring to the odorant process? To the injection of the nitrogen. The injection of the nitrogen. Was that in your construction specifications, or is it an operations or a construction task? So all of the gas, of, I think what you're getting at is, was there a procedure for that? Was there any approval for no, that? No, no, I'm asking you whether or not it's a 
whether it was within your construction specifications for this project as they were approved, number one, and number two, whether that's an operations task or a construction task under the federal rules. I, I can, as I say, I can answer the, the question that the federal rules on construction operation, I'd have to look at that. Um, for the gas up, every procedure was, a specific procedure was developed for the working hand. So every one of those has a specific procedure that was done and uh, created, I would say, within three to five days of the actual work being done. Okay, and for the installation of the, the pipe as you installed it at a lower, you installed it so at fewer feet or maybe it settled, but you used a different, um, a different technique for actually laying the pipe, as I understand it, than the one that was approved and that was in your original specifications. Did you have a written separate specification and plan for doing that? And did you do you have the documentation that demonstrates your analysis and the decision and the justification for changing that uh, technique? So I can speak to the technique that was used is slightly different. However, when you look at our specifications, every single step is not detailed. So there is some discretion for the construction team in the field um, and the construction technique that they used uh, we feel is consistent with the plans as presented. So, really quickly. That's all, I'm done, thank you. I'm gonna get, um, I'll quickly um, do the presentation of the last thing and then we can, you don't have to ask questions about the last thing, but we just gotta <laughs> present it quickly. Just one quick thing before we move on to blasting, and that's sort of what the schedule is for resolving the docket that we were, or the proceeding we were just talking about. We're in the middle of discovery right now. These are some of the critical dates. Um, the, the hearing is now scheduled for April 19th. Parties will file briefs in May, and then the commission is expected to issue a decision sometime shortly thereafter. So this is the, the schedule that the proceeding we've been talking about is proceeding on now. So case number two, it's a 174630, and we refer to it as the blasting. It's, um, it's similar but different in that in both cases, the commission is looking at whether or not we have violated our CPG by failing to follow something. In the first case, it's failing to follow the, the MOA or the final board order. In this case, it's whether or not we violated our CPG by failing to follow the requirements of the blasting plan that was uh, approved by the commission in the final order. Failure to follow that blasting plan could also be a violation of the memorandum of understanding we have with the town of Moncton. And if you remember from the first, one of the first slides, the, the commission or the board requires us to honor those MOUs. So in each case, if there's a violation of one thing, it could be a violation of another. So they're, they're linked. Um, so a little bit of background here. The, some areas of the pipeline required blasting in order to construct. We filed a blasting plan in Docket 7970. The commission approved that blasting plan. That blasting plan has a lot of details in it, but the ones that are sort of relevant to the docket or the, the case that we're in now are notices around um, the, how we provide notice to affected landowners for blasting and how we conduct pre-blast security. So uh, just like we entered into an MOA with Velco in 7970, we also had an MOA with the town of Moncton in 7970 that included some provisions related to blasting. Okay, move on. So the history on this case. Um, uh, June 2016, Main Drilling and Blasting, who was Vermont Gas's blasting subcontractor, um, conducted blasts along Old Stage Road in Moncton. Uh, one of those blasts damaged some wooded area of a landowner on the other side of the street, other side of the street from the blast. We notified that landowner. Um, a civil suit ensued. We have settled the civil suit with the landowner, but as part of that settlement, there were some re remaining questions around our regulatory compliance. So uh, part of that settlement said we're going to provide some additional information to see if the scope of those issues can be narrowed, and to the extent that we cannot satisfactorily 
answer the landowner's questions, we would report to the Public Utility Commission those allegations and our response to them. So the, the list of issues did get narrowed, but at least five remained. So on August 11th, consistent with that settlement agreement, we made a filing with the commission around the five allegations, and they're regarding uh, notice of blasting, inadequate posting of pre-blast, uh, inadequate posting in the blast area, inadequate pre-blast security, whether or not we had an uh, on-site representative uh, while we were blasting, and whether or not we violated the, the Moncton MOU. So these are the allegations that we made a filing to the commission on August 11th. On September 13th, the landowner made a filing with the commission asking that an investigation be opened up into uh, whether or not we have complied with our blasting plan because the filing that Vermont Gas made on August 11th, um, unlike us asking for substantial change, we did not ask for anything. We simply made a notification filing. So the landowner subsequently made a filing with the commission asking the commission to open an investigation into the matter. Then on October 6th, the Department of Public Service filed basically a concurring letter uh, supporting the landowner's request for an investigation. October 24th, the commission opened this case, and we are right at the very beginning of it. The schedule has not yet been established, but there's an expectation that it will likely go along a very similar schedule to the case that we just talked about. And if that's the case, they would probably have hearings sometime in the same time frame. So this case is in a, this blasting case is in a very different stage. It's, um, it's very early. And unlike, if you go back to the chart I put up about the different players where Vermont Gas made a request, independent um, parties will look at it and the commission will rule. In this case, Vermont Gas did not make a request. A landowner made a request um, supported by the department that the commission open an investigation. The commission has done so. And we are, um, as I said at the beginning of this, um, preparing information. And that's the second case. Thanks. And just so you, from the department's perspective in that case, and Jake may have mentioned this, we've just issued an RFP for a blasting expert. And what they'll do is look at the VGS plan and see what they think of it generally, and then look at whether you know they, they met the plan, and then look at the specific instances. And what's an RFP? Request for proposal. Sorry. So I'm at the Department of Public Service, as is Jake, and we're one of the parties to the proceeding. Mm -hmm. This is Vermont Gas. Correct. And then we just had a lawyer from the Agency of Natural Resources come in and be involved in one of the cases. So. Yeah, I got a question on blasting. Um, part of the blasting procedure before and it, it was, they came and uh, you were so close to where they're going to blast, they would take pictures of your foundations and stuff. And uh, my brother's house, they came and they took pictures of the outside of the foundation, but they didn't want to take pictures of the inside of the foundation. And his house is sitting on a ledge that was blasted through. When he, when he did his his foundation, he, he blasted actually a ledge under his house that's attached to it, and he, but he put a foundation. Well, it shook the, the foundation. He had some cracks in it already, but it, it moved it. And he talked to Vermont Gas, and they said, you got to talk to Maine Drilling and Blasting, who did it, because they were responsible for their insurance. And so they came and they denied it. They said, well, we didn't do it. So what? who do we go to now? Can I answer that? I, can I interrupt for one moment? Yeah. Because Eileen, you stood in Cornwall at our little school meeting, and that question was asked of you with the blasting, and you said the buck stops here. Vermont Gas is responsible. <laughs> you don't have to litigate or mitigate whatever with our subcontractors. We are the party that is running this project. So he should never have been sent to being blasting. Vermont Gas should have handled that. So let me tell you, now, I'm going to be honest because I'm more recently familiar with wind cases. I, I've read the, the blasting case is very new. But if you'll, I'm going to give you my card. If you'll call me or email me, we have an investigator <laughs> who will um, contact the company for you. 
and we'll go from there. And it may, you may want it to be a part of this case or something else, but we deal with those. Okay. Um, that's. And, and Mary, I stand by that statement. At the end of the day, the block does stop it from oil gas, and ultimately, we are responsible for for the actions. I I don't dis I, I don't think that's anything inconsistent. Well, the inconsistency I see is that he was referred to main blasting, and you had said that Vermont Gas was it. You were running the project. Your subcontractors were weren't the responsible parties. You were. At the end of the day, that is true. That was in 2015, and now it's. Well, I, I stand by that at the end of the day, that is still true. So really, he can just speak directly with you about this, or the CEO of Vermont Gas. Right. He doesn't have to talk to Jim Porter. If he's not getting satisfaction from Vermont Gas, his next recourse would be the department. But he should be able to speak with you. Yes, of course he can speak to Vermont Gas. And get results. I don't know. So I, I, I'm sorry. I, I just don't know the details of the claims. I, I can't promise what I don't know. But absolutely, he can talk to Vermont Gas, and we'll see where we go. But I, I don't know the details of, of your brother's situation. I don't know the details. I certainly can't promise something that I just don't have any information about. And one thing we have is a person on staff um, who's actually familiar with these type of complaints, and he'll do an investigation and go out to your um, to your brother yeah. house and, and talk to him and look at it. Now, the, another question about the blasting is uh, um, our, in our contract with Vermont Gas, we pretty specified that we wanted the contour of the land put back to the original contour before it was blasted. And we have areas where, you know, when you blast seven to ten feet down, it brings a lot of rubble up. And uh, we got mounds that, you know, it's not the same contour because there's a lot of rubble still there and we're still negotiating a restoration of, you know, let's get this back. But I'm, my concern is how deep is the pipe in that where they blasted in the rubble? I mean, the, I think that the contract said it had to be two feet below the original surface where in solid ledge. But when it when you blast and it comes up six feet, how, how deep does the pipe have to be? So if you have trouble with that, actually last year the legislature gave the um, department the ability to um, investigate these type things if they're potentially a CPG violation and to issue fines. But if it's a larger thing, then we might want to recommend going to the PUC. But if you have difficulty with any of the parties, just feel free to contact us. We have people, that's what they do. I'm Bob Atchison, I live in Plainfield. I'm an engineer of VTrans. And if I were you, I'd be embarrassed about the slipshod contracting that's been going on. A decent excavator can control the depth of what he or she is digging. You've got people that are blasting one side of the road and knocking down trees on the other. <laughs> What's up with that? You know, I also have a history of working on the pipeline in the Newport, Vermont area back when I was in high school. And this was the Portland pipeline that went through. And there was do, 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 do caution for putting this pipe underground. Careful inspection of the wells, careful transportation of the pipe to get it to the site. And this is like crap work for what? To get your frack gas to some place that it doesn't need to be. And isn't wanted. A uh, question for yeah, DPS. I, I understand that your engineer, or engineers, I think you said you have one internal, one external, uh, have deemed the burials safe. And uh, is that correct? Did I understand? If there's not a safety issue with the depth of cover, I think that's um, correct. All right. Now, I assume, did they base these findings, their uh, conclusions, on data provided by BGS? Or did they go out and, and do their own measurements in all these sites and make their own factual determinations? So let me answer that as best I know it, and I'm fairly new to. I, I come right, down it's a pretty agree. simple Fair, question. I'm fairly well. Our internal engineer um, is on site and investigates things frequently, 
and then, and I do not know how much was his and how much was um, from the VGS affidavits. Um, I want to say it was a combination, but I could be wrong, but I think it was both. Then we have an outside expert who looks at the facts, if you will, and makes recommendations as to the, the facts provided by VGS. Well, generally, as far as you know, generally the facts provided by our, by our internal engineer and his observations. He will say, "I noticed this, this, this," and then we get a, an opinion. Mr. Mr. Winner, you're probably for that is. aware, maybe going the field, but related to this issue of of, of credibility for whatever reason, uh, we had similar problems with Agency of Natural Resources uh, relying on BGS wetland determinations. Um, I was <coughs> a plaintiff in the Prague Park case, and, um, and, and the reason we were involved, uh, we were brought in, allowed in, because uh, I was part of a group um, that managed the park and became by firsthand you know, involvement aware that an agreement between DHS and two of the five select board members um, uh, was presented to the then Public Service Board as a legal agreement. Well, um, there's fault all the way around, but um, at the very least, there was some serious negligence going on. Um, and then, going again, going back to the wetlands issue, the same thing happened. Uh, we found out only because um, one of our members on the commission happened to have some wetland background, who's here tonight, and went out with uh, Mr. Quackenbush, actually, just by coincidence, and said, said, tell me if I'm wrong, but is this area that UGS's experts are saying are not much wetland. Are they right about that? Because it looks like wetland. He said it's a no-brainer. I can see this, this is wetland. Now, how did this happen? Um, there's a lot of employees, subcontractors. Maybe everybody's not doing their job. Maybe the communication is not so good. But this, this, like the burial issue, this was the one that we found out about because this was the one where people happened to get involved, where a group got involved and said, hey, this smells funny. Um, and BGS said, oh, this is the only case where we, you know, we mistakenly went into wetlands. Um, it sounds like they're saying the same thing here about burials. Um, maybe you want to disagree, you know, this is your position, but uh, uh, my feeling from my long experience and very difficult experience in, in fighting this Prague, and, and eventually they drilled it. And, they, and it was a good job and they used a new contractor and they knew this was the first, the first time they drilled instead of trenching, which was their, mm -hmm. their original. You know, and they did it because of our involvement. And, and they were under the microscope when they did it and they knew it. And uh, we probably got the best drilling in the whole state of Vermont. Uh, but I think there is enough history, and I'm, not, and I'm not making any character evaluation. This is, we're dealing with the business. Subcontractors, employees are responsible to their, to their bosses, to the marine contractors. VGS is responsible to its parent company. The parent company is responsible to its shareholders. This is their primary responsibility. The state has a different responsibility. And I think we need to verify to, to hire our own investigators to be paid for by VGS, but who are directly responsive, responsible to the state, <coughs> whether it's part of public service, PUC, I, you know, but, but not responsible to VGS. Let me give you, um, if you'll send me your contact information, I'll get you an answer to that as well. Yeah, I, I got excommunicated from the Conservation Commission from her.
We're not being such a trouble. Maker. We're not going to excommunicate. Okay. And to all of you, um, as I mentioned earlier, we started the new um, CPG investigation protocol this year. And so, if you, anytime you think there's a violation of the CPG that you're familiar with, let us know. As I say, we have an investigator for that now. So, just, first of all, I. I I know that this area where there are 18 shallow locations in New Haven is a designated state significant area because of the wetland value uh, and it's categorized as that by the Agency of Natural Resources. And so my question is why was the decision not to do HDD in this precious wetland from the get-go when you are required to do HDD under various other precious wetlands throughout the state? Why not? do HDD in that site. And also, you know, to point out, we lost the opportunity to, to demand that you do HDD when you face problems because we didn't know about it until it was long done. Nine months after the fact, it was all done. And so we, the state never had a chance to say, hey, you know what, if you're having problems in this precious wetland area, instead of crashing through it, how about do HDD? So that's one of my questions. Why wasn't HDD required in the first place? The second question I have is about streams because, Again, um, as I understood it, there were, you know, there's an, uh, an, an, a memorandum of understanding or agreement with A&R about streams. This, from what I could see, shifted over the years from being, you know, requiring seven foot of depth under stream crossings to only under certain streams that had certain uh, uh, characteristics, the bigger streams to, well, we met the minimum federal requirements under some streams. So a question in my mind is why, what was the purpose of requiring seven foot of depth under those streams in the first place if it was so easily thrown away during the course of the process and the construction? What was the point? And I'm saying this in part because I know we have somebody from ANR here who can maybe address that. Why was there a seven foot depth required under all those streams and then how could A&R come to the conclusion afterwards that it was okay that, well, we actually cut it back to five and we limited the scope and the number of streams that were required and, and in the end we really only did HDD under a few streams and only put, you know, went to the seven foot depth under a small number of streams, but A&R says that's okay. So how, what is the point of having a certificate of public good and a memorandum of agreement if you don't care whether it got followed or not? It's just an exercise. Uh, I can't answer your ADR question. Um, I don't know if anyone here can answer that. Uh, so, uh, my name is Jeff Nelson. I'm with the HP uh, firm that did the environmental permitting for the project. And um, the streams on the project do fall into two different categories. The larger streams with a drainage area of greater than one square mile are the streams that are considered jurisdictional under the state's stream alteration permit. Um, and there were, I believe, just under 20 of those crossings. The depth requirement for those per the permit and per the plans was seven feet, meaning the pipe had to be at least seven feet below the bottom of the channel. And the rationale with those streams being, the, the pipe being at that depth for those streams is that over time, as we all know, streams and rivers can move, they can move from side to side, they can move downward, down cut, and so the depth requirement is to ensure that the pipe remains buried at all times, and that's the, the judgment of the agency was that seven feet was the appropriate number. Um, for the smaller streams, less than one square mile streams, there really wasn't a clear articulation in the plans. There was some confusion in some of the plans as to what the, the standard ultimately was. Um, from our communications with the agency, there was not a specific technical concern about having a shallower depth. And ultimately, the plans were clarified for the contractor in 2015 um, to indicate that a five foot depth was the depth for those areas. There were still some areas in the plan where there was contradiction, but the, the inclusion of a specific table to indicate five feet was the effort to um, ensure that that was the number that would be followed and was followed for the remaining construction. And Rachel, um, Don Einhorn from a &R, he got car trouble, but he's got the letter that he filed by both of those five streams, if anyone wants to see it, and I think answering. We, we had filed um, comment letters in yes, response to the that. requests, so I have copies, 
And I didn't it, see that already. It's both. If anybody wants these, I'm sorry I'm late. I have car problems, but maybe we can just hand them and can pass them down and people want them, take them. But um, as Mr. Nelson indicated, we um, there are what we call jurisdictional streams and then non-jurisdictional streams, and the jurisdictional streams fall under our permitting uh, authority to issue stream alteration permits. And who determined whether they're jurisdictional streams? Is it BHB or you guys? Um, it's it's under. I'm I'm not positive on this, but my understanding is it's under our regulations, our permitting regulations. So they determine define, under your regulations. Yeah, it's, that's my understanding. And Mr. they were for probably knows more about that than I do, but. Um, at a certain size drainage area from the watershed into the stream, that will trigger the need for a stream alteration. Yeah, I understand that, but I do see how it could get fuzzy. And somebody who worked for BGS would see it one way, and somebody who doesn't would see it another. No, it's not. It's pretty, it's pretty clear cut. We have all kinds of GIS data that maps watershed areas and you can pull it up on a computer and verify. Like the wetlands were based pretty on that. clear. Pardon? Like the wetlands were pretty clear at Jeffrey. Um, wetlands are usually evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so in any event, the jurisdictional streams are subject to the stream alteration permit. They're generally your larger streams or rivers, and they had specific depth of burial requirements in the permit issued by the agency. And I guess that should have been specified in the CPG, and then we would have known which streams and which weren't we're going to get the seven feet, which ones we're going to get the five feet. As I understand CPG, it, it's, it said they needed to comply with the permits issued by the agency, including the stream alteration permit. And then that permit identifies with specificity the streams and the depth um, that needed to, be, needed to be accomplished under those streams. And that was met. And then there are the non-jurisdictional streams. And there was not any per se burial depth requirement required by the agency. As I understand it, the plans that Vermont Gas prepared for erosion prevention and sediment control, which were part of the stormwater permit, identified open trench burial at seven feet of depth for streams. So because that was a technical detail in the erosion prevention sediment control plan for the stormwater permit, it effectively became a condition of that permit and a condition of the CPG because compliance with the stormwater permit is required by the CPG. However, the depth of burial is not a material factor to the purpose of an erosion prevention and sediment control plan. It's to prevent discharges of sediment-laden stormwater to receiving waters. And that doesn't, it doesn't, there's really not an impact if it's two feet of depth, three feet, seven feet, 10 feet. So while that was a condition of the permit, because it was incorporated into the permit, stormwater permit, through the plan set, it was not what we would call a material condition. And by not achieving that depth of burial, it did not have an impact on natural resources. So, and that's what our second comment letter explains. Because the burial depth that was achieved, even though it was less than seven feet, the agency experts looked at that and determined that the burial depths were sufficient to deal with stream channel issues. Did, did somebody actually go and look and, and, and go in the field and look at those streams and make that decision? Like, or did they just, how was that? The decision, as I understand it, is, was based on the area depths. So nobody actually went to those streams and said, oh, that's, that's okay, the stream will be okay, with a shallower depth of cover than was agreed. It's because of the size of the stream it was sort of a statistical decision. It's, ba it's based on the size of the stream and how much streams move, how much streams downcut when you're dealing with that size of a watershed and what the typical burial depth 
would be required, and we wouldn't require a sense of burial depth for those. What does the Army Corps of Engineer permits require, and how does that intersect with A and R's permit? Um, I'm not real familiar with those, but I think they deal more with uh, fill. In probably Mr. Nelson can, can address that, but in, in certainly fill in wetlands or um, fill in streams, I would assume. Um, we're more interested in the geomorphology of streams, which means the movement of water and the movement of sediments and the movement of how channels migrate over time or may downcut, and to make sure that something is either deep enough or far enough away so that it's not going to interfere with what the stream wants to do naturally over time. And that determination was made that at the depths that were achieved for these non-jurisdictional small streams, it wasn't going to present an issue to channel migration or downcut. I got a question it's around water. We have a, a drainage ditch we, we dug years ago with a drag line. And I, I talked to Vermont Gas. If it's silted in quite a lot and it, about digging it back out and cleaning it out because it was about five feet deep when it was originally dug. And I, I talked to the contractors and I said, make sure this is deep enough below so when we dig it out, it, you know, it won't hit it. Well, all said and done, the, the drainage ditch is level. The water above the ditch is running into our, our meadow and it's turning our meadow into a marsh. There's cattails growing into our meadow where we used to grow corn. And we, we haven't resolved it yet. I did talk to Dave Walker and he said, well, well, maybe we could put a culvert, dig it down and put a culvert either under the pipe or over the pipe to, to let the water go through. But how deep was it supposed to be in drainage ditches below it? That's, that was my question. I don't know and I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. And if drainage ditches would even be jurisdictional from our perspective as to whether or not we would have to say over what you do or couldn't do those. I'm not familiar with mm. that. Okay. Thank you. My question is why are there so many unanswered and seemingly unanswerable questions on this project by Vermont Gas? This is a danger to all of us and a huge expense that is out of control and has been since it began. Why are we doing this? Why are we all sitting here yet again asking the same questions and new things keep coming up? And this company, which is owned by a Canadian company, is not doing, fulfilling its responsibility and should not be doing this project? Well, all I can say is that- um, And don't give me your card. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess we're here because we have allegations of two violations of the certificate of public good that, you know, there may be more. Um, this, this was a big project. Um, any kind of construction project, when it's completed, you know, you start looking at everything and um, there may be some more issues that come up. But I would differ with you. Our engineers do not believe there are safety issues. Th these are very much compliance issues with the city. <coughs> um, I think uh, folks have if there's just a couple more questions, we were supposed to begin the public hearing and there are a number of people here and I just heard what sounded like public comments that the commission might want to hear. Uh, so uh, we can we can answer the next two questions and then we'll take a little break uh, and, uh, and move on to the public hearing. Okay. Um, I have a safety concern also, which is inspecting the pipeline four times a year <coughs> means once in the winter. Mm -hmm which is not enough. I mean, there's pipeline accidents in the news practically every week. And it seems to me it should either be based on weather or it should be weekly or something way more often than once. So who would, where does that sort of a input, where so does that go? I would have to defer to an engineer to answer why things are looked at. Well, it isn't even a why, I would like to bring that somewhere. Where so the, the thing that we need to bear in mind is that those, those pipeline inspections four times a year are only one part of an overall pipeline maintenance um, protocol, including 24-7 monitoring by gas control. There's, there's a, that's only one piece of the ongoing pipeline maintenance. That's just the, the foot patrols four times a year. The, the pipeline 
has flown regularly. The pipeline has uh, monitoring by gas control 24-7. I can't speak to other companies. I can only speak to Vermont. I, I just can't. I can speak to Vermont Gas and Safety. So the hearing officer gave us one more question. Anybody that has an ask a question? Um, what I'd like to know is, when I was young, my father said to me, you have to do this. My friends and I talked with each other. We didn't do what my father asked. I had to answer to my father. Now, Vermont Gas and the drillers and such and folks said, well, okay, Velcro can agree that it's three and a half feet is okay. Why didn't you respect the authority above you in the CPG, which said four feet? That is exactly the question that's before the commission right now. The commission is your father in this case. That would be the, that would be the higher authority, and that's exactly the proceeding that we're um, we're here discussing tonight. Do you have a answer for that? Um, I do, but I'm not sure that the uh, the councils on the other side would agree. From it comes back to the fundamental question of whether the, that Velco MOA, whether it was the loading standard that prevailed or the four feet that prevailed. That, that, is, that is the nub of the question that the commission needs to decide. That's when I said earlier, their lawyers, us, and Mr. Daymont, we all may have different ideas about that, which the commission But if it was below decide. four feet, you would, you would meet that load standard, and there'd be no question. Can, can we have one more from someone who has not asked a question? Please. Um, my name is Jennifer Vianock, and I, I live here in town, and um, this is related, I guess this might fall under what you would call other concerns. And um, so I, uh, about three years ago, um, I began to experience uh, some really terrifying harassment at my home that occurred around my participation in the pipeline, the citizens' activities with the pipeline. And uh, I'm really interested in if there are any other people here who, who feel that you've experienced any kind of harassment at all related to your activities around the pipeline. Um, I've stopped my participation in, in pipeline activities um, uh, due to my doctor's uh, recommendation that I no longer be involved in it because I became sick. And um, so if anyone would like to see me afterwards, I'm really curious if things that may have happened to you are similar to what happened to me. So, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and take a 10 minute break. It's now 7.45, we'll start back up again at five minutes to eight. And we have the facility until 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna put out a, a sign-up sheet, two sign-up sheets, one on each table. If you want to make a statement, please come up during the break and sign in. Sign up. Your comments and that the court reporter can record them. I'm going to ask you this is, this is our virtual lectern here. Um, if you can come up to this position, turn and face the crowd, that way everyone can hear you and be seen, be seen by them and use the microphone. Uh, we'll get started here in a minute. I will. It's on my script. I have to wait till I get to the script. Otherwise, I'll get it wrong. Sometimes, you know, it happens. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. This is Vermont Public's, Public Utility Commission public hearing in case numbers 173-550-INV and 17-4630-INV, which are investigations into whether Vermont Gas Systems Incorporated violated the Certificate of Public Good in Docket 7970 by failing to bury the pipeline at the required depth and failed to observe the requirements of the blasting plan, respectively. <coughs> My name is Mike Towsley. I am a staff attorney with the Public Utility Commission and have been assigned as the hearing officer 
in both of these cases. As you heard earlier, there are representatives here from uh, VGS, and they had the opportunity to uh, interact with you in an, in an, in an information se session earlier, uh, as well as uh, representatives of the Vermont Department of Public Service and the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. And Mr. Dumont is also here. He represents the interveners in both of these cases. <clears throat> This public hearing is a joint public hearing, uh, and it's likely, uh, although it has not been finally determined, that, the, uh, that much of the remainder of the proceedings for these two cases will be held jointly uh, for efficiency since the parties are all the same, though some of the witnesses will be different. Uh, that's not been finalized yet. Uh, I, saw, I only saw the request this afternoon, uh, but that request is out there, and um, We'll, we'll make a determination here in the next week or two as to whether or not those things can happen at the same time. Uh, Who requested? All the parties. All the parties requested. And that gives me the opportunity to remind everybody that you had your chance to ask questions before. Um, I'm here to listen to you, uh, not to answer your questions. If there are procedural questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. But the, sub the subject matter has been addressed and the questions for the subject matter has been addressed by the folks who spoke earlier. So please, please uh, don't come up and ask me questions because I'll, I'll forget my name again. Uh, at, over on the table along with the sign-up sheet, uh, there were a couple of handouts. Uh, there's one is a handout that talks about how to participate and how to file comments uh, and it addresses uh, I sure could. Thank you. And I'm sorry that you weren't able to hear me earlier. My name is Mike Towson. Um, there are a couple of handouts over here on the, on the second table that address um, basically commission proceedings and how they work and how you can participate in them and how you can file comments. And there's a, uh, there's basically the schedule for 3-550, uh, which has been agreed upon at this point, although may change slightly in the next couple of weeks, uh, is also listed uh, in, in those handouts. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to provide you with an opportunity to hear input from the public regarding these two investigations. The comments received at this hearing will become part of the public record in these cases. You can also provide written comments using the Commission's Electronic Document Man Management System, EPUC, or by direct mail or email. Con contact information to do that is on the handouts that are over on the other table. You can also subscribe to the case in EPUC, which means you will receive an email notification of any Commission order or filing made by a party in the case. You will have to log into EPUC with an account, and if you're unfamiliar with that, the, the Commission's uh, website does show how you can do it, and you can always call Holly, uh, the, uh, the deputy clerk, who's more than happy to walk you through the process of uh, subscribing and entering and using the EPUC system. Tonight's hearing will be transcribed by a court reporter. This transcript, along with all other comments received by the Commission, become part of the case's public file so that commission members, staff, and participants in the case can consider the comments. Although the comments do not become part of the formal evidence in this case, they can be helpful in raising new issues and perspectives, and the commission is responsible for addressing those comments as part of uh, its review and final report. The transcript of this public hearing will be available on EPUC, which is accessible directly online, or from links on the Commission's website, which is located at uh, puc.vermont.gov. We have now 20 or 19 folks who've signed up, or 20 folks who've signed up, and I'll take them in the following order. What I'll do is uh, I'll know I'll. I'll try to say, I'm going to say five names at a time. 
uh, so that you know whether or not you're in the batter's box or not. Uh, the first five to speak are Jane Palmer, I had asked Ms. Palmer to come up, uh, Barbara Warebridge, Mary Martin, Rachel Smoker, and Lawrence Shelton. And I'm going to ask that when you do come up, you, you say your name again and spell your last name for the court reporter so that it gets correctly into the record. Ms. Palmer, you may begin. My name is Jane Palmer, P-A-L-N-E-R, and I live in London. I am one of the interveners in case number 173550 INP, represented by James Dumont Esquire. Um, tonight, I do not intend to argue any of the legal points to be made during the investigation. Tonight, I want to talk about the emotional and physical stress from, that results from living within the potential impact radius or incineration zone of the bomb gas pipeline. My husband and I argue vehemently with the PUC to not accept or approve the pipeline project. We argued the environmental issues both here in Vermont and at the other end of the pipeline where the extraction of the gas occurs, the unacceptable economics and the moral issues. One issue we did not argue was about safety. This is because we still trusted that if the project were approved, the Department of Public Service would oversee the construction and Vermont Gas would build the pipeline to the stricter state safety standards they agreed to build it to. And even though more fossil fuel infrastructure was not needed, farmland, wetlands, and public parks, parks would be desecrated, and the ratepayers would have to pay for a project they would not benefit from, we were confident the pipe would be built to a greater level of safety than the federal minimum. Over the past several months, I have been privy to information that indicates that not only was the pipe not built to the standards agreed to, it was not even built to federal minimum safety standards. I now know from reading accounts from the gas company and employees of the Department of Public Service that the guidelines and specifications spelled out in the CPG were not followed during construction. What I don't know is the extent of this negligence. The PUC has agreed to conduct an investigation into the depth of burial of the pipe in New Haven, where a citizen documented the shallowness of the pipe. Had other citizens been vigilant, there may well have been other areas where specific violations would have been observed and documented. But the problem is, we let our guard down. We trusted and believed the PUC when they put in the Certificate of Public Good that the project would have oversight. And if any violations occurred and were observed, they would be corrected. We were assured this personally by the chairman of the Public Service Board, James Bowles. Now there is anywhere from six to 48 inches of dirt covering over that pipeline that may or may not have faulty wells, faulty well sleeves, may or not have to be buried deep enough or with the coating still intact. It may or may not have been laid on and surrounded by a soft protective supporting the material to protect it from abrasion from rocks or damage from heavy vehicles traveling over the pipeline. We are left with a strong sense that this pipeline was built recklessly and without oversight, leaving us with a compounding or coincidence of risk factors that make an eventual rupture even more likely. Will that happen in my yard or in my neighbor's yard? I lay my head 300 feet from this pipeline every night when I go to bed. Can anyone tell me the certainty that this pipeline is safe? Our public service department kind of deflected our worries. We were all paying attention to the cost of the project, and the department put a cap on the amount the ratepayers could be charged for. But the result was the contractors and the gas companies company was were motivated to build the pipeline as cheaply as possible so the company would not have to pay for any more than the necessary overspending over cap. My husband has a saying, you can build things good or you can build things cheap, but you can't make, build things good and cheap. A couple of months ago, my neighbor called me and asked if I could hear a noise coming from the direction of the pipeline. It was a loud hissing, just the sort of sound you would imagine a high-pressure leaking pipe would make. When I stepped outside, I heard the sound, and it frightened me. But 
But what really made the hair stand up on my arms was that my neighbor had called BGS and asked if they were working on the pipe. And they said they had no knowledge of anyone working on the pipeline. I decided to call 911 and ask the dispatcher what to do, and he said he would call the fire department. In the meantime, I am thinking, another neighbor who is in her 80s and is a shut-in and can't walk far or drive, I was thinking I would have to go toward the south and gas escaping to bring her to safety. This entire episode lasted for about 20 minutes to half an hour until BGS finally determined that they did in fact have a crew sandblasting on the main line valve behind my neighbor's home. In the meantime, the fire department had arrived and I had already called my neighbor and told her to get ready to evacuate. This was an entirely terrifying a few nights ago, we had a freakish thunderstorm, and before I realized the loud rumbling I could hear coming from the south was actually thunder, my mind raced to explosions, and my neighbors and our house being in the path of a huge fireball. These fears might seem a little irrational to the unenlightened, but knowing what I now know about the infractions committed during the building of this pipeline, they are entirely rational. Please, do not think that a fine or more testing will make us safe. No amount of testing after the fact can make up for lack of oversight, inattention to federal minimums during installation, and rushed construction, which allowed problems to be buried in the first place with a proliferation of long-term unknowns. This pipeline has to have been built according to the way it was specified, and if it was not, it should not be allowed to operate. If a person has a car, that does not pass the state, state safety inspection, they are not allowed to operate that vehicle on public roads. This faulty pipeline is potentially a thousand times worse than a ride out car with an engine light that won't go out. I urge the PUC to do what you must to ensure the safety of all people who live near or pass by this pipeline every day. Because now we have a pipeline in our midst that is not only not delivering the public good promised, it is posing a dangerous risk to the safety Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Ms. Wearbridge? Yes, thank you. Ms. Barbara Clearbridge, like clear sky, clear. Okay. Clearbridge. Okay. I also have safety concerns about the pipeline, not only how deep it's buried, but about the inspections of it. We know that the normal precautions and safety standards are not good enough because in the news there's pipeline accidents every month, even more often than every month, and there are, some of these are horrendous accidents. And even one accident is too many. So I don't think it should be whose lawyer is cleverer as to what the outcome is. I think we need to overdo the safety, bury it deeper, inspect it more often, these are our lives we're talking about, and our homes, and our futures. When I asked that question earlier about more inspections, I was told about all other kinds besides walking inspections. We track it this way, we track it that way, we track it the other way. But all the other companies building these lines are doing the same things all over the country, all over other countries, and they still explosions and damage and other things going on. So I just want to say again, one accident is too many, and I would like four feet to be the minimum. I, I think the, the company can't put the bottom line first in this instance. It has to overshoot the mark. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clearbridge. Sorry, I mispronounced your name. That's all right. Ms. Martin? My name is Karen Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N. Um, some of this I said earlier, but you weren't here, so. Um, Vermont Gas stated it would build this pipeline for one above and beyond federal pipeline safety standards. Vermont Gas said they had never used eminent domain and had no plans to do so in this project either. The blasting accidents and other violations the company claims were the fault of their contractors, not them. Vermont 
project that Bob stops here with us. And the parent assured us that the pipeline depth requirements would be followed, even if they had to cover the pipe one shovelful, one spoonful at a time. I think we know it's fallen way short of that. We never trusted this company's practices, and they have proved us right time and time again. We knew Shulman and his minions were in favor of this project, but we mistakenly thought the Department of Public Service and the Public Utility Commission had our backs as far as safety was concerned. Imposing fines does not make the pipeline any safer. We don't trust the fox to guard the hen house, and we shouldn't allow Vermont Gas to investigate their own violations. At the very least, we want a mutually agreed upon private party, third party, to investigate, and Vermont Gas should pay that bill. Ms. Smoker, and then Mr. Shelton, and then Mr. Hurlbert. Hi, I'm Rachel Smoker, SMOL. And Mr. Taz, I'd like to start by just thanking you. I've seen you on several occasions act with great integrity, and I'd, I'd just like to take that opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. I don't normally read my interventions, but I am going to do so this time. Um, very stilted, but we studied this project in as much detail as the public record requests that we have filed allow. From that, we've become aware that among many other issues, there are persistent problems with padding support backfill and compression of backfill around the pipe, in addition to the depth concerns. We know that the DPS inspector observed this problem in one location. The company denied it was a problem, but it clearly was a problem. The company said, well, it's a problem, but we only laid the pipe on the bottom of the trench without padding the support in place in one location. Then lo and behold, a little later, some other places were discovered, and recently, even more locations lacking backfill padding support materials. One of the locations where this was the case is the New Haven Swamp, the same location that we're talking about where the shallow burial occurred. We're not pipeline engineers or experts, but we can see that the ANGP project specifications include very detailed requirements for trenching. That include how it's, the trench is dug, dewatering, supports under the pipeline in the trench, laying the pipe into the trench, filling with select backfill material under the pipe, around, over the pipe. The select backfill has to cover the pipe by 12 inches over the top, and should be mechanically compressed in, in, uh, so that the materials don't um, uh, uh, um, settle over time. This is all part of the trenching specifications. Uh, and I have a document here which I'll hand to you, which has an illustration of how that is supposed to be done. It's very particular. Select backfill material usually is sand, or it can be screen material that has to be all the stones um, above a certain dimension have to be removed and so on. These specifications exist for a reason. It's considered important to ensure that the pipe is not vulnerable to damage from abrasive rocks or from loading, like when a vehicle drives over the top. Without proper compliance to the specifications on backfill, the backfill can settle. The pipe may be vulnerable to wall crushing, dents, and bending. In June of 2014, a DPS pipeline uh, uh, safety consultant, uh, David Berger, stated in pre-filed testimony that the department, and I'm quoting, the department recommends BGS be required to use clean select backfill directly around the pipeline to prevent rocks and other debris from causing an integrity issue, such as that which was described in the reference response as the cause of a leak on another pipeline owned by BGS. This leak was caused by a rock rubbing on the steel pipe. Using select backfill without any rocks around the pipeline will prevent this problem from happening on the new pipelines. That was Mr. Berger's pre-filed testimony. 
The presence or absence of padding, support, compressed select backfill is integral to the issue of depth. After all, the depth of the trench has to accommodate both the padding and the support underneath the pipeline, as well as the 12 inches of cover over the top of the pipeline, and ultimately, the depth measured from the top of the pipe to the ground surface. So it's an integral part of the depth equation. Also, digging deeper trenches, purchasing select backfill, and hauling it to the site, uh, or using equipment to screen material to get rid of the rocks, including also equipment for compressing the backfill, all takes equipment, time, and money. Now in Haven, we have a pipeline that was buried too shallow. There are potential risks. It lacks the specified support material, which adds more additional risks, and it is located under high voltage overhead lines, which introduces yet further risks, and it is located in a wetland where the soil is mushy and changes over the year. Pipelines move. So we have multiple compounded risks, and this is just what we know about one location that happened to be the location where somebody took a photograph, delivered it to PIMSA, PIMSA came back to BGS and said, what about this problem in the wetland in New Haven? And eventually BGS came to the state and said, hey, we have a problem, we need a non-substantial change designation to our permit. Would that have all happened? If we hadn't taken those photographs in that one area and delivered them to PIMSA and PIMSA come to the state, I wonder if BGS would ever have come and filed for a non-substantial change or just gone on with their business. The problems in New Haven only came to light as a result of our documenting and conveying those to PIMSA. In other words, BGS got caught. In the communications we delivered to PIMSA, we raised many other issues. Those included things like failed Canusa weld sleeves, an alarming lack of comprehensive written specifications for the contractors, which is very worrying, violations of electrical safety requirements, gross misinformation, and failure to provide notifications concerning the odor and leak issue that happened in Williston, unqualified workers, and more. I have in my, uh, to put into your hand here, the table of concerns that we delivered to PIMSA in April of 2016. To the best of our knowledge, many, if not all, of these issues still remain pending and unresolved, even though BGS is now blowing a pipe through the pipeline. Those issues have not been resolved so far as we can tell. PIMSA tells their stakeholders in information online, no amount of testing, this is PIMSA's words, no amount of testing after the fact can make up for lack of oversight, rush construction, which allows problems to be buried in the first place with a proliferation of long-term unknown risks. The PUC process tends to treat one thing at a time, but it is becoming increasingly clear it is the collective burden of compounded risks added to the nature that demands a far more comprehensive assessment. Problems have occurred throughout all years of construction, lack of oversight, multiple concurrent construction sites. The public cannot rest easy. We rely on the DPS to do their job of oversight and enforcement to ensure compliance with the regulations, not just the minimum federal regulations, but the much more stringent regulations that were part of the Certificate of Public Good and were put in place specifically to protect Vermonter safety and our environment. DPS failed us, and we have been forced to do their job for them because we care. If this pipeline blows, who will be held responsible? Will we find ourselves sometime in the future standing here after some horrific accident saying, we told you this would happen and you didn't listen to us? Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Ms. Smoker. Uh, Mr. Shelton. Okay, so <coughs> Mr. Hurlbert, Ms. Clock, Mr. Conrad, uh, Mr. Hyams, and, and Casey White Whiteley are the next five. I am Lawrence Shelton, S-H-E-L, Lawrence Shelton, S-H-E-L-T-O-N. 
um, resident of Hinesburg, member of a concerned group of citizens who have been looking into alarming evidence of shoddy and reckless construction on the AGP. Earlier tonight, um, in the public um, portion of the comments, I noticed a, a, a flippant, cal cavalier dismissal <coughs> of um, you know, uh, safety issues. And um, the, the, this photograph that they talked about, I noticed the DPS lawyer turning to his friends at BGS and, and getting clarification from them. Yeah, that's, that's that picture. That, that, that's nothing. That doesn't count for anything. Um, I took that picture. I was um, in the swamp in New Haven. After work, we shut down on September the 19th. All the equipment was demobilized from the site. There was a, a machine there that uh, was a, a light um, stand. The excavator went on all of the, the heavy equipment was demobilized from the site. Whatever they did the next day, they they did uh, during that one day with, with whatever equipment they mobilized from the site and brought in to finish up.
talking earlier about the blasting, you know, my brother's had a little bit of foundation graphics, we still haven't resolved that, but he's kind of given up, he's kind of an insurance company. They deny it the first time, and the second time, I don't know how it becomes more of a headache than a story sometimes. But uh, we do have areas, like I said earlier, where the, the, the rubble was, was left, big piles of rubble, and, and we very specifically in our contracts that the lands can be put back to the regional contour. So we still we're still working on with the wrong gas negotiating. Um, we are still working on the, the mylar maps that are to be recorded in the town. We uh, we still have the deed in escrow and we're still working on that. To, but uh, Dave Walker seemed to state that uh, you know, try to get it done, I and mean, it seems to state that they're not going to finish up until they get the deed. So I wish they'd get it done, but uh, there's, there's areas, uh, when they were getting down near the swamp we are talking about, that's, well, we own part of that swamp. And uh, when, when they were doing the planting, I said, you guys need to border over to that. There's no bottom in it, but they wouldn't listen. And, uh, when they were digging the, the field before the swamp, when the swamp started, you know, even down the line, we, uh, again, I went down and checked it for the deep enough, so I took a picture and called Dave Walker, and not deep enough, so they came back and they, they dug, dug some side it, and I zoomed it's deep enough. And then when they got out of the swamp, the water started running out of the swamp into our field, and I asked them about putting trench breakers in, in to get our field, and how we're going to keep the water. Was migrating from the wetlands into our, our corn field. Uh, there's still a place that we drive the tractor across and it seems right in, so I don't know how long it's going to take for it to settle. Did put in contract that the lands, the soil is supposed to be compacted to the original compaction that it's put in. So um, we'll see. There's a lot of settling, there's still a lot of uh, areas that the topsoil is going to be brought in. They did come in a couple of years ago with a truckload after a truckload of topsoil because the pipe wasn't deep enough. They did put soil over it. There's still areas where there's wetlands now and uh, they can't go in there and put the soil in because it's a wetland area. They can't fill it in. The contract did state that where the water was regulated, that they were put drainage pipe in to drain it out. And once the inner drainage ditch is filled in, they told them that to, uh, we were going to clean it out to get it below the six foot depth, and now it's, it's level right to, even to the top. The water above is running into the field. We're still negotiating that. We've got a lot of issues that we still got to get done. Um, the area down the swamp. You know, I, I walked down there when they were putting the pipe in, and they, they dug a trench and they put it down a couple feet deep. And I was told that they came in afterwards and dug the trench beside it and pushed it down. But it's, it's a swamp. I mean, it's a, it's a soup. And I, I think some of the pipe had concrete on it. I don't know if all of it did in the swamp. You might want to check it and just see if it does. That, that might be something that the board might want to look at. Um, but that area, they, they, I mean, they put matting down like they did on the rest and drove in and matting sunk in and they got brought in big long mats and corduroy did so they could get in there. I mean, they, got, they got through after a while. I mean, one of their excavators slid off the mat and it was sunk. And uh, at the nine o'clock at night, they had to make the bowl to drag that excavator up through the, the field. So it was really wet in there. It was, it's, uh, it was, it's amazing they even got it in with the way, the way it did. I can see why it's probably not deep enough. But hopefully, you know, if you cut concrete on it, you can put concrete water in say so hopefully the pipe will go down and they should check it at a different, you know, be good to go on gas go in and recheck it to see if it's settled down. Because I mean three foot depth, I mean I've seen new skitters in there logging in wintertime getting buried. The big skitter tires go down three feet, they're buried. So they might hit it. So I'd like to get this done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Clock?
Is it pronounced cl clock? Uh, sometimes, but usually cloven. Cloak. <laughs> Sorry. Tell people cloak. Uh, I brought up at the earlier uh, question and answer period uh, the idea of the CO uh, certificate of uh, public good had designated, and it took me a while to find that information out, uh, had designated that the pipeline had to be uh, laid at four feet. And now it seems that the, uh, it was modified somehow. I'm not sure if the PUC uh, was involved in that, but there's, it's somewhere between three and four feet. Four feet is the natural depth of things in the state of Vermont because of the, the cross line. And I'm very concerned about that. But I wonder why, if this was the designation in the uh, Certificate of Public Good, how could that be changed and still be legal? It just doesn't seem right to me. And if it's in a swamp, what's the problem with getting it down deeper? It's not like you gotta dig more dirt in the solid surface or you came against rock and you couldn't get it down any further. I mean, what's, why is there an issue of getting it down four feet like it was supposed to be? And then there were some comments that were made by the VGS that uh, this was because it was in the Velcro uh, corridor. Well, the Velcro folks are probably very nice folks, but they don't, uh, they can't speak for what the uh, certificate of public good said was the legal uh, place that it had to go. So as far as I'm concerned, they just done what they wanted to do and just didn't finish it correctly. And that's a concern. It seems to be another instance of uh, non-trust on the part of the public. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Mr. Conrad? Good evening, Ross Conrad, C-O-N-R-A-D, in the Great Vermont. Um, basically, I just want to request that the Public Utility Commission um, not take Vermont Gas's word that the trench was not deep enough only in 18 places in this one area where it just happens that a Vermonter, a concerned citizen, happened to get a picture showing a pipe being laid in that wasn't deep enough, and that just happens to be the only spot that wasn't deep enough. I find that very hard to believe, and that's because of Vermont Gas's past record. They have been consistent in being unreliable, starting with claims that they have never done in a domain when they did in the very first pipeline coming down from Canada. Um, they claims of not trespassing on people's property, uh, being due diligence when they hire people they have contractors work on the pipe without a contract. I mean, if they work on the pipe without a contract, do you think they were really given all the written materials to follow the, to put in the right, right way, um, and then, you know, taking care of endangered species, uh, reporting financial fiduciary information, just consistently over and over and over. The long gas is proving their work is unreliable. So please, I was hoping the Utility Commission has the authority to actually uh, have an independent third party confirm that the rest of the pipe is actually buried appropriately. And don't use anything from the long gas. You can totally separate from the long gas and their numbers and their work. Um, just have someone else just to confirm it, 
to see if, if this is another instance of Vermont gas saying things they want us to believe, maybe they actually believe it, but it's just not true, or if they really did um, do the job correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. Mr. Himes? Close as you can get. It's not a race, though. Robin Hines, H Y A M S. I am a member of the Hinesburg Conservation Commission, and I want to talk to you about wetlands, and in particular, wetlands in Hinesburg. As a member of the Conservation Commission, uh, we had real concerns about the route of the, the proposed route of the pipeline going through the park. We went out, we went on the ground, and we saw a lot of wetlands, and a lot more wetlands than were ever on the, uh, on the site plan. And, you know, there's, there's wetlands, and then there's wetlands. And these wetlands, you did, you did not need to be an expert to know that you were in a wetland. In fact, if you were in it too long, be up to your knees. Somehow this did not make it to the map, to the wetland map. And we took it up with the Department of Public Service, asked, hey, what do we do about this? Oh, too late, it's already been approved. We took it up with wetlands, uh, talking to Laura LaPierre. She said, no, we've already approved it, it's done. And it, it was not until we had to pay the interveners for the wetlands ecologists to come out and say, yes, this is a wetland. We finally got the wetlands program to come out and verify that, in fact, it was a wetland, and happy ending, we got to drill into the park. Well, the other thing we did is we decided to go out and look at the other public wetland crossing in Hinesburg, and sure enough, we found similar results. By all indications, those wetlands were not properly delineated either. So, what are the chances that two crossings would yield two poor or insufficient wetland delineations? And maybe it's not enough for a pattern, but uh, combined with all the other stuff we're hearing tonight, it certainly sounds like a pattern. So, I guess what I would ask of you is to consider as representatives of the state that really you guys do not have the capacity to manage and oversee a project of this size. And if that's the case, then you should not be permitting projects of this size. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Himes. <clears throat> Casey Whiteley. This is my uh, personal comment and addressing any specific violations. In the past few years, as I've been watching the process of approving the BGS pipeline, I have lost my faith in our democratic institutions like the Public Service Board and now Public Utilities Commission. As a Vermont citizen, I am deeply disappointed and angry in the failure of both the department and the PUC to protect the public safety and serve the public good of the citizens of this state. To allow the number of public safety concerns, the cost overruns, and BGS violations to continue and accumulate is a dereliction of duty. It is challenging as a citizen observer not to assume a level of partnership between our state administration and departments in furthering and facilitating the construction goals of the Vermont Gas Pipeline. What possible rationale would lead the PUC to approve the continuation of a dangerous pipeline carrying fracked gas that locks us into using fossil fuels for generations to come? Instead of, if we wanted to help Vermonters, we would be investing in meeting the renewable energy goals of the Vermont Comprehensive Energy Plan, which is to use 90% renewables by 2050. 
We are not on track to achieving that goal. Instead, we are on a track heading in the opposite direction. Increasing our dependency on fossil fuels imported like the fracked gas from Canada coming through the BGS pipeline. The real goal, it seems to many of us, is that we're using Vermont as an energy corridor to get fracked gas from Canada to global markets. It's really not to lower energy costs for Vermonters, is it? If we really wanted to do that, we'd be working on renewables to get us off our dependency on fossil fuels. We need to stop this pipeline and invest in our future for the next generations and to protect this planet that we live on. Thank you, Ms. Whiteley. Uh, Bobby Cornwath, Julie Makuga, Lisa Barrett, and Bob Atchison. So, Ms. Cornwath, please. Bobby Cornwall, C A R N W A T H, Ellen Cornwall. Um, actually, I didn't come for my pair to speak, and people have uh, been so articulate before me. So, I'll just say a couple of things, and one is something Rachel said about um, the way the process works. Those of us who have not been in favor of the pipeline for a long time have worked through the process step by step. And everything, you know, everything, it's a cost overrun, it's the safety concerns, it's one thing and then another, and the PUC finds its way to get past that one technicality that's in the way. And I, I'm just asking the PUC to please just make a list and just uh, keep an overall picture how problematic this pipeline has been. And I was there in, um, in Middlebury, in Middlebury, in Middlebury, and I remember the similarity of saying, uh, BGS doesn't do eminent domain, never has, and certain flying never will. And it's just been, you know, kind of keeping track of what BGS is saying and what they're doing. And I don't know if it's fair for folks like you have to come from Cornwall to all these meetings to just kind of uh, keep track of what's going on. Um, so I think that's all I want. Just hope that you're keeping ongoing notes of how this process is working and it'll be useful for you in the future. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Julie Makuga. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Masuga. Masuga. It's M-A-C-U-G-A. My name is Julie Masuga. I'm a senior at the University of Vermont pursuing a degree in environmental studies. I would like to start with a quote. Pipeline safety is ensured through compliance with design standards and regulations, not setbacks. This quote is found in both the Certificate of Public Good and in the rebuttal testimony of John Marcus Yang Sierra, former VP of Vermont Gas Systems. I attended the last public hearing on October 10th. Many people spoke with fear in their voices. They are afraid that projects like these will leave behind a planet that is not livable for their children and grandchildren. As one of the children they spoke of, I am afraid too. <laughs> But that rhetoric has fallen on so many deaf ears. This time, I speak with fear for the immediate future. I volunteer with the group Protect Rags Park, in which myself and my colleagues have sifted through hundreds, if not thousands, of documents from foods and regulations, numerous PUC filing claims, and public records requests. I wish I could say that this was the first time that death was an issue. But this time two years ago, Vermont Gas was in court with their own contractor regarding 5.6 miles of a pipe that were buried too shallow. This time, Vermont Gas neglected to inform ANR, DPS, and PUC that they had made arguably substantial changes, at least not until we brought photographic evidence to the department's attention. The photographs, according to John St. Hilaire's August 11th testimony, show that the pipe is what is committed is in what is called a staging trench. Even if St. Hilaire's testimony is correct, there are a number of violations that are still visible. According to Vermont Gas's own 2016 version of the technical specifications, quote, the contractor shall 
shall remove all water from the excavation promptly and continuously throughout progress of the work and shall keep the excavation dry at all times until the work is completed and excavation is backfilled. Minimum depth of cover shall be strictly adhered to. No pipe shall be strung before the trench is excavated to full depth and meets the requirements of this specification. Pipe shall not be placed directly on the ground, but on wooden skids with, for top, with proper protective padding. Regardless of St. Hilaire's testimony, the pipe is clearly on the bare ground and in the water, with no backfill. This is another in a catalog of ignored safety measures, and each compounds the rest. In the past, with many of the people in this room, I stood in the way of instruction. Then I bought shares of Gas Metro Vermont Gas's parent company and tried to plead with their investors to stop this project. Now I come before the Public Utilities Commission with my concerns, hoping that they will listen. Even if we ignore the inflated cost of the project and the environmental degradation, it would be unconscionable to ignore the risks to human health and safety that this pipeline poses. We don't want to wait for errors to pile up until we end up like the folks in San Bruno, California, where a natural gas pipeline exploded, causing a fire that left eight people dead. The reason for this tragedy? Disregard for the rules and regulations, coupled with inadequate record keeping. There is no fine that Vermont gas can pay or shirk on to their ratepayers that would excuse them from a leak or explosion. Perhaps it is easy to move on when the sunflowers are destroyed, but what about the human lives? Vermont Gas should properly bury this pipeline before we have to bury our friends and neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Masuga. Lisa Barrett. And in 
some cases, the death table is inconsistent with the remediation table. In other words, the death table, death table says the final death is X, and the remediation table says the final death is X minus something. The contractor Michaels did not finish its work for Vermont Gas until December. Vermont Gas then had almost three months to ask the PUC for an amendment. During that time, VGS still could have sent the excavators back in or perhaps have drilled the pipe under the swamp if that was what the PUC wanted. Instead, Vermont Gas and the Department of Public Service did not disclose the non-compliance until June, after the pipeline had completed and the gas was flowing to customers. The train had left the station before the PUC had a chance to weigh in. Vermont Gas insists it has no responsibility for this problem. Their root cause analysis explains the cause as follows. I'm reading from the root cause analysis. Root cause. The soils in the clay plain swamp were deep and wet, resulting in the inability to maintain trench stability while installing the pipeline along its entire length. That's the root cause. Vermont Gas takes no responsibility for the failure to identify the problem of soupy soils ahead of time, or for its decision not to use HDD, or for anything else. In other words, the root cause was the swamp. So who's protecting us? The federal agency, FIMSA, recently found that the department was not doing an adequate job of assuring compliance. Department records show that inspectors found violations, but no action was taken. So at the very least, we need independent physical measurements of the depth of cover. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Mr. Atchison. Atchison. My name is Bob Atchison. I come to you from Pikeville, Vermont, where I serve as energy coordinator and also a member of 350 Vermont. I'm so you know, and we work very strongly on climate justice issues. It's bad enough that the fossil fuel industry is peddling their poisons by harvesting them from the ground at the expense and cost of the working people of the planet, while somebody else sits there and makes their big profit. And secondly, bad enough that then they purvey this poison to the citizens of the state of Vermont with the claim that it's safe. We're going to get there. We're going to do it. Everybody will be happy. And we won't have to raise any costs because that natural gas, that's the golden fuel of the future. No. It's, it's all about risk assessment. We saw it way back in my day when Ford Motor Company decided that it wasn't worth fixing the gas tanks on the Pinto cars because we've got enough lawyers, we get enough money to pay off the few deaths that may occur. And it goes on to this day. The risks involved are not worth the cost of one human life. The risks involved are not worth the death of the planet, the death of the people of the planet, and handing off to our children and our grandchildren poisons that they can never deal with. And so the big, the big train goes on. The, from an engineering standpoint, this is just a farce. You know, why can't you do it once, do it right, do it with integrity, do it with morality, and have it fixed and, and stop this new launch that's going on here. I'm going to close with my mom's words. It is a bad thing if you do something wrong. It's even worse when you lie about it. 
Thank you, Mr. Atchison. The next five begin with Kevin Leverett, then Bill Marks, Juno Chapin, Jane Peacall, and Rick Barston. So next up is uh, Mr. Leverett. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Leverett, L-E-V-E-R-E-T. And uh, I, I've been thinking about the certificate of public good. Public good. I can't believe it's in the public good to risk polluting the environment by assured future leaks, especially when you consider that um, renewable energy has shown that fossil fuel should, for now on, remain a fossil that is left in the ground. Isn't it ironic? Why are we concerned that the pipes must be buried between three and four feet below grade? Because it belongs in the ground. Too bad the uh, clay plate swan isn't the La Brea target, a suitable burial site for fossils, fossil fuel. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to illustrate a gas, but the, the same people that are producing the uh, frac gas are also producing the uh, So there's the opal. This thing is a uh, hundred feet radius. That means 200 uh, foot. This is the leak. This is that ground ground spot is the the, the frac uh, fuel that has spilled. The the what was it? 200 uh, ten thousand gallons. Yes, indeed. So. For like 200 feet across, how does uh, um, 21, uh, 2,100,000 uh, gallons fit in that small space? It's because it goes down deep. So there's a lot of volume there. Uh, I don't know. It, it really infuriates me to see waste like that. But it even makes me mad to see it um, not in the room. Not a good finish, but. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lovett. Thank you. Mr. Marks. Bill Marks, MERKS, as in Carl. I have a specific request for the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, it's, I think it's pretty much the same as what Lisa Barrett's uh, is. Um, and that is that the commission hire its own um, investigators and experts, uh, mandating that BGS uh, pay for them uh, to do independent testing of the burials wherever there is a question of death in the state. Um, However, my experience or my reason for showing this uh, lack of credibility, because to me this is a credibility issue, um, is uh, more in line with uh, Bob Hines' testimonial earlier in that um, I was involved in the Craig Park case. In fact, I was the uh, plaintiff, not because I'm the most particular or most knowledgeable issues, but because uh, I was um, the one person who had uh, uh, control and management uh, authority over the park for the longest period of time of anyone, uh, 14 or 5 years, and the, the uh, hearing officer had to 
insight, this understanding that I grew as something for true. Well, uh, what I learned in the course of this case were two various damaging things. One, um, which really has more to do with, uh, perhaps, for my guess, is uh, legal advice in that um, because of other citizens more aware than I was, uh, there turned out to be a uh, quote unquote secret agreement between uh, certain town select board members and Vermont Gas to convey an interest in land. Um, this was stopped, but um, any, um, uh, any any attorney I would think would, would know enough when presented with a, a municipal agreement to make municipal property not to rely simply on the signature of an attorney uh, because, in fact, the majority of the select board members didn't even know about this alleged agreement. Um, and, there was, and there was no public vote. Um, in fact, there was no vote. Um, this shocked me that a company of this size would accept and present to the Public Service Board an agreement with, with this background. Um, but you say this didn't make any more to do with the legal advice than, than the rank and file of, of Vermont Gas and, and which brings me to the next point, which was the other shocking thing, and, and somewhat embarrassing for me, because being a, I'm a long-term member of the Conservation Commission, or was, but not an expert in wetlands. And when I heard the experts um, hired by Vermont Gas tell the public, the public hearing, that uh, their proposed course avoided most of the wetlands and the least impact, um, and they presented this finding the fossil to the ANR, which uh, accepted it because they don't have the um, ability to do the field work to check the background, they accepted these reports, and they presented it to the, uh, uh, in, in testimony, um, I believe. But in any event, um, it was Bob Hines who discovered uh, uh, this error, and uh, in fact walked these wetlands with BGS experts, and, and watch their embarrassment in, in seeing their error. Now, why this happened, I don't know. But the fact that we were probably the only group because um, it was land managed by environmental activists, uh, who knows how many other areas in Vermont where they crossed wetlands that were not accurately delineated. Um, we were not able, of course, to Determined that, and no one has, uh, including the ANR. Um, this relates, I think, directly to the burial issue and why um, we need to have independent um, verification of the underlying data. Um, and again, it's not, uh, my, my distrust is not based on any personal. Certainly, the animosities or, or, or believe that anyone is particularly blind, but I think there is a very clear loyalty uh, between subcontractors, employees, their bosses, and the shareholders ultimately. Uh, and that's understandable as a corporation. Their, their loyalties are not to the public, which is where we must step forward, I think, and be more aggressive. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Uh, John O'Chapin. Jonathan Chapin, C-H-A-P-I-N, John was a nickname. I don't really have any prepared comments tonight, um, but I have great respect for all of those that did come prepared and that have been following this uh, colossal uh, travesty over the course of uh, a number of years, maybe it's four or so at this point. Um, I think we have some really disturbing dynamics that are going on now, and if you think about it, the 50 to 70 people that are here probably would be multiplied by a factor of 10 if this issue wasn't so complex. Um, it's highly technical. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it takes a great amount of effort to try and stay on top of all of this. Um, 
we have citizenry here and volunteer um, efforts and, and people that are showing up on their own time. Um, we have the world that we live in now. It's, uh, it's a question of inequities, um, very disturbing again. Um, the world that we used to live in was, uh, and the lives that, that we used to lead were of trust, of, of honesty, of working together. Uh, and I think now we live in an age of disinformation, uh, a totally different ethic, and business, money, and power seem to prevail. And this hearing has an opportunity to try and once again see if we can turn that around. Um, we have a stream alteration issue, we have burial deaths of the pipeline, we have um, a public service department which doesn't seem to really be serving the public um, over and over again. Uh, safety, non-compliance. Um, if you think about this, it's a little heavy, but appeasement over and over again in this process. Uh, when World War II was going on, that was very effective. Just say, we're peaceful, we're just going to come in and take over your country, and everything will be okay. And then it marched on and marched on and marched on. This is a type of appeasement process that business is very adept at. We'll go ahead and do what we want to do, and then we'll either ask permission or pay the penalty later. And we've got to stop this. It's, uh, it's insidious. Um, a penalty is, uh, you know, some form of, of uh, reconciliation, but the penalties are never high enough. So if you're in business, pay a penalty and move on. Uh, the penalty has to be so egregious that a company is going to say, we got to adhere to what needs to happen um, and, and comply. It can't be about non-compliance and, and so on. Um, I think there's, I come from the woodworking world, and it used to be <laughs> measure twice, excuse me, measure once, and cut twice. And this seems to be the opposite. We'll just go ahead and, you know, we'll do what we got to do, we'll go back and do it again when somebody tells us we did it wrong. Um, I just don't want to feel that we are in this position where the, the wool is being pulled over our eyes and that we're, we're just sort of helpless. There needs to be a sense that a, a, a person that's trying to follow this process and wants to speak up is not just going to be bowled over by a corporate um, uh, process that just can out-legalize uh, the common citizen. By a show of hands, if people are so inclined, who is here of their own free will uh, testifying tonight and is not paid? I'd like to acknowledge that there are many people, well, not maybe many, but there are definitely some people that are paid here, and they're paid for the whole process of guiding this pipeline, it's a navigational tr sort of track to get to the other end. And when you're paid to go ahead and figure it out, you're going to snake your way through it. And that's, that's, that's pretty, um, pretty scary. Uh, so we have the world that we used to live in, and it was trusting, and it was with neighbors and a sense of community. And we have a, tr a, a, a world that we live in now. It's really problematic. It's about inequities. It's about uh, disinformation. It's about um, power and money and business prevailing. And if we don't get a handle on that, our our democracy and what we stand for is really it's already in, in peril. We've got to have a chance to go ahead and change those dynamics, disturbing dynamics. You need to live in this world and have a conscience about what you do, do it well, 
and have it so it matters, not just for your own bottom line, but for everybody, because we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapin. Jane Peacall. And the next three are Rick Barston, Jennifer Vinick, and Barry Bailey. So it's people, P-E-K-O-L. Um, I did want to say thank you to all the citizen inspectors and enforcers uh, who seem to be putting up the slack. And that is from the bar business. Sincere thank you. Um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, and in August of 2016, um, I took a trip to Susquehanna County to see kind of exactly what what went on there during the fracking free-for-all. And the image that stays in, in my mind is the, the one of the bed stacks on top of, you know, what used to be household water wells, or teaching wells, to vent the gas that had mixed in with the water um, to prevent the household's well from exploding or exploding again. Um, so, the image of, of vented water wells, you know, one after another, and the water buffalo tanks sitting next to the houses supplying water are not images that go out of your mind quickly. Um, so those families in Pennsylvania, they, they lost their water uh, to fracking chemicals and gas contamination. Now to haul their water, uh, spending time and effort and money. So they really lost something. And the families here in Vermont who had to move, who lost their land, or who no longer feel safe on their land um, for the purposes of transporting an explosive fossil fuel that is worse than carbon dioxide, um, have also really lost something. And I, I was just heartbroken to see all this happen in the city grew up in, and I was frankly shocked to see it happen here. And I'm heartened to see some states and countries, and even cities and towns, banning fracking. And if I were the CEO of Vermont Gas, I would start diversifying um, quickly, and I'd recommend looking at renewables. Thank you, Ms. Peacock. <coughs> Rick Barston. I, that's Rick Barstow, B-A-R-S-T-O-W. Um, I wasn't really planning on making any comment, but I noticed one curious thing during the presentation, uh, which I think is indicative of this whole project, and it had to do with the streams and the burial depth that uh, I thought should be seven feet under these streams because the potential of erosion and cutting down further from the, the existing stream bed. Um, we all know that weather is becoming more severe and the likelihood that we had a flooding event that would, could really cut right down to the stream bed um, it becomes more and more likely. Um, especially, who knows, in another 60 years, this pipeline just supposed to be put in for 60 years out. Um, I hope we're long done with the need for such pipelines by then, but um, this just shows how um, this Vermont gas and the parent companies that go along with it look for ways to cut costs um, in for expediency um, to do this project in a way that yields more income for the shareholders and those at the top who really have no interest in the safety of citizens. Um, and so I see this is maybe a situation where it's time to turn this whole thing around. This becomes a moral issue, um, allowing this kind of corporate greed, which I think people begin to wake up to the fact that it's become so rampant, it's, it's 
problems that we're, we're dealing with right now. Um, so I would hope that um, the PUC going forward and whoever is responsible for making decisions about what kind of projects um, get the green light, um, that there would be a much higher degree of scrutiny um, and oversight so that we're not um, faced with this kind of situation where there are many safety concerns. Um, I guess in, in summing, um, I guess this. Great, thank you, Mr. Barstow. Ms. Vinick? That's Jennifer Vianock. That's V as in Victor, Y, H, N, A, K. Um, I live here in Bristol, and um, I spoke a little earlier tonight, but I feel this definitely needs repeating. And um, just to, you know, early on when this local citizens heard that the pipeline was coming. I really had it in my heart that, um, you know, I wanted to be a part of educating the public. And uh, um, my mother said, Jennifer, there's a movie you need to see. I've saved it on HBO for you. And it's called Gasland, the movie. Well, when my mom speaks and she says she's got something for me, I'm going to watch it. And I watched that movie and it changed my life. And I bought that movie. I got back to Vermont. I gave it to Dave Sharp, our local representative. And uh, he, I believe he may have shown it to some of his folks in the legislation in, in, in Montpelier. Three years later, I don't know if I had any, maybe a little something to do with it, perhaps with a lot of other people, but Vermont banned fracking. And um, so that movie definitely puts into perspective a lot of the things that we've all heard here. It speaks to uh, a larger picture that it's really important for people to understand if you want to know why folks are motivated about being good to their neighbor, taking care of one another, you know, basic human decent kinds of things that I think is at the bottom of a lot of motivation here. So anyway, um, I took it upon myself to show that movie to as many people as I possibly could back here at home. I was going to towns and some with folks here and um, one evening it was being shown at Otter Valley High School. I mean, I mean, Otter Valley High School was hosting Vermont Gas. Um, and I gave him a call and I asked the principal, I said, well, you've got Vermont Gas there with a demonstration of what they're gonna do. Can folks who have another point of view also be there? And the principal said yes, so we had a table. And um, I, I created a handout which mentioned said I'm showing this movie to people because I believe it identifies the activists among us because you get stirred when you see the culture that this fracked gas came from and the culture of this of the industry and um, that was probably an unfortunate thing that I made that document with my phone number on it my name because things started right after could be a great coincidence for all I know. But um, ever since that time, uh, for about mm, perhaps six months, I experienced things at my home here in Bristol at night. And I got phone calls and I got emails that were um, pretty awful. And um, I did tell my doctor about this and my doctor said, Jennifer, you need to just get out of this. Just leave this whole thing alone. And I did, but um, it definitely affected me, and, um, and I didn't talk about it. I did not share this, I did not really share this with my fellow activists because I didn't want to scare them. I didn't want them to think that there could be anything that might want to hurt them from, or, or deter them from their activities, so I kept it quiet. And that was probably a mistake. Um, but I did tell a few people 
I felt like my life was in danger. And um, so I told my friends, I said, if anything happens to me, um, you know, because in my effort to showing this movie, I, I, I really helped touch the hearts of a lot of people who are here tonight, activists. I mean, this is a movie, if you haven't seen it, you should see it, Ghastly in the movie. Um, so, um, so I am here now, advocating for myself, and I realized that in order for me to get well, um, I would like to find other people who think that they too may have experienced harassment, terrifying things that have affected their health, and um, so if you want to come up to me and we can talk, um, I think it would be a fascinating topic, and you know, who knows, there, there might be a little investigation at some point. Um, so I guess that's all I want to say. And I thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Fionic. Ms. Bailey? Barry Bailey. B-A-R-R-I-E. B-A-I-L-E-Y. And I'm from Salisbury. The whole time this evening, as I was listening, I wouldn't want to speak, but this theme kept going through my head. Precedence. We've been setting a precedent with this situation for three, four years. There's been double speak. Lands and threatening landowners with eminent domain, they don't sign on the line right away. And oh, you can't tell anybody what you got paid for. And then they find out. Other people are treated who fought back. Numerous cheerleading by the Department of Public Service for BGS instead of being in service to the public. Numerous environmental violations, lax enforcement by BGS, by the Agency of Natural Resources, and to me, the Public Service Board, now the PUC, has also been lax. What I see tonight is that the local people here are the ones who are actually doing the due diligence of oversight. This is an open invitation to other corporations, especially fossil fuel industries. So I'm coming to other areas of Vermont because you can get away with things because regulation enforcement is so lax. That's not what we should be doing in Vermont. We do not want to set a precedent as an open invitation for the large power struggle of fossil fuels against the little guys. We need to hold our heads up high, ask our Public Utilities Commission to do the right thing, create a public investigator who's not associated with our public service, I've lost faith in them, who's not affiliated with a &R, who cannot get out in the field and do their own assessment work. But someone who's truly independent and is not directly paid by our podcast, but will be billed through the state uh, to Vermont Gas. So I ask that you, on the Public Utilities Commission, please consider the precedent that's being set and help us go on a straight and narrower path so that we aren't seeing this precedent for others to come after us. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. And finally, uh, Mr. Is it Poisner? Pausner. Pausner. Uh, hi, good evening. That's Pausner. P as in Peter, O W S N E R. What was your first name? Oh, Jake. Jacob. Jacob. From Ireland. Uh, I guess I have more of a personal comment. 
I just wanted to apologize uh, to the future generations of Vermont uh, that are going to have to live with our actions. And uh, I think we all failed to come together. Um, and I think that there has consequences. I think in our apology, I think that the UCO's apology, I think Belco's apology, I think Vermont Gas was an apology. And uh, I hope one day in a conversation where we can talk about making amends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Pauser. <coughs> Mr. Kishik? My name is George Cloak, S-K-L-O-K-H-C-K. -K. I'm a retired former minister of the Methodist Church in Middlebury. And Middlebury is where I live now. And I've been thinking of some time to go on. I know I've talked a long time, but I think I had something to add. And I want to do it from this perspective that a good religion and good religion, good religion and good living, is more about love than it is about rules. Which is not to say that rules don't matter. And that Love is the motivation for keeping the rules. So I've heard that every four and seven, four feet, seven feet, imagine. These are rules that I wish that uh, they were enforced. And I'd like everybody to remember who has some leadership position or responsibility that involves other people that we're here to love and care for each other, to love and care for the earth that is ours to use and to live in and to preserve for others. And to uh, be people who respect and honor and care for each other in every way we can. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Cloak. Is now 24 speakers. Does anyone else wish to speak? If no one else has additional comments, thank you to everyone who came tonight. We appreciate your comments and concerns. Good night. <laughs>